hour in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. With Gene and Chris on the Paracast, we're joined by Leslie Kane, investigative journalist. She is a best-selling author of a UFO book, which is an extreme rarity. We don't get too many of those. She's researched UFOs as an investigative journalist for over a decade and has lots of important insights. And we're going to cover what she has to say, particularly also about a forthcoming UFO conference and about a certain conference we've talked a lot about called the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure. But first, Leslie, first, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be back with you guys. Now, we got this item that you're hearing about probably for the first time. You don't have to comment on it. Maybe Chris and I will talk about it briefly before we get into it. There's an article from Tony Bregalia, who recently had written a piece being skeptical of the reality of the Socorro, New Mexico UFO landing. And now he has a piece where he concludes that Aztec is really Roswell. Chris, did you read this piece? I, I did, Gene, and I'll tell you, you have to hand it to uh, uh, Tony Bregalia. He's uh, quite quite creative in the way he analyzes some of these historical cases. I, I absolutely disagree with his assertions on Socorro that it was a hoax by uh, by college students. Uh, there's just no evidence to back it up, and the, and the evidence he proposes does, doesn't fly. Understand that Tony is a member of Kevin Randall's dream team to investigate right. Roswell. So exactly. this particular piece here, and it's already gotten response from Frank Warren and some others at the blog site. What is he concluding here? Well, from the tone, it, it sounds like he's saying that, that Aztec was actually disinformation trying to take the focus away from Roswell, but that much of the information about Aztec actually could be applied to the Roswell event, which which shows some pretty creative thinking on Bregalia's part. But, you know, I, I think we really need to, uh, you know, to come up with some more solid uh, evidence to back up that assertion, and I'd be very interested to see if he's able to do that. The basic conclusion here is that Aztec was meant to be disinformation, to refocus attention from Roswell. And if that was true, maybe it succeeded because we didn't start talking about Roswell till the late 1970s. Yeah, correct. So, you, you, But again, I must underscore the creative thinking going on here and uh, creative analysis. I, I do appreciate uh, out-of-the-box thinkers, and although I don't particularly agree with uh, some of the the assertions that uh, Bregalia has uh, proposed in the past, uh, I think this one deserves some attention because uh, kind of has a ring to it, and I I'm, would be interested to learn more. Leslie, do you have any particular opinions about Aztec or Roswell? Unfortunately, I don't. No, I mean, I, I just don't. I'm not well-informed enough to have opinions about them, about sure. those particular cases, I mean. Sure, and I think... At this point, getting new information about those cases is probably going to be impossible unless some miracle occurs. In any case, Leslie, now, before we discuss this upcoming event, we have had several episodes referencing the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure sponsored by Stephen Bassett, which took place recently in Washington, D.C., featuring ex-members of Congress. In fact, in the case of one ex-member, former Senator Mike Gravel, I think he's been out of the Senate for, what, 30 years, Chris? Something like that? I, I think 81, yeah, even longer. Wow. So, you know, he, he needed a day job, I guess. Now, Leslie, you weren't there, although a lot of interesting people were. What's your reaction to this sort of thing? Boy, it's a, it's a complicated question. Um, I don't know. I almost don't want to answer it, but I have put some things on my Facebook page about it because I was quoted in the New York Times. I mean, I basically just wanted to stay out of the whole thing. But I was quoted in the New York Times, and this upset some people. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that, that article in the I'm Times. I'm aware of the item in the New York Times. Okay. I thought it was a fairly balanced article, unlike the one in the Washington Post, which I think just denigrated the entire thing. But what about the New York Times article bothered you? Well, first of all, I do agree that I thought it was the best article that came out of the whole thing because it was serious in its tone and also just the fact that it's the first article the New York Times has ever published that's serious on this topic. And I, I spent a lot of time with that reporter and I gave him lots of information to kind of inform him that there really was something serious about this subject. And I think, that, you know, he made this quote that I said, I didn't think that the event in Washington was serious. 
And it's not quite that simple. I didn't really like the quote because I felt it was taken out of context. So basically what I had tr problems with initially was the fact that Stephen Bassett did what he always does, which is to claim that there's an extraterrestrial presence, I guess he calls it. There are extraterrestrials here that are communicating with humans. They've been here for decades, and the governments of the world are covering this up, and lots of people know about it in the government. And, you know, he, he thinks half the Congress knows about UFOs, etc. And so I just don't accept the very premise that he operates from. And because I think it's one that I know, I mean, I don't think this, I know this, that the official world does not accept those statements as being facts. And when somebody makes those statements, they don't want anything to do with them. Um, you have to start with, you know, information that you can prove with people that, that don't know anything about the subject and people whose reputations are at risk if they get involved with it. So I was sitting there, you know, before, I mean, I was just disappointed that Steve didn't tone the whole thing down if he's jumping into the middle of Washington like he did. And I think that by not doing that, he was actually feeding the media information that, of course, they were going to ridicule. I mean, it was just like, obvious to me that they were going to ridicule this thing before it even began. Because when you make statements like that, what do you expect? And that's exactly what happened. I mean, these articles came in and what they were focusing on was that one point that he made about aliens. So all the articles, you know, a lot of them anyway, that I saw were, you know, oh, going to Congress and because they're claiming that aliens are here and aliens this and extraterrestrials this. That's what the media fixates on because it's the most ridiculous part of the claim that he's making. And so I was just very disappointed. I felt like this was an opportunity where if he had s made some sensible statements and just decided to try to prevent evidence uh, for things we can back up, more like I, what I'd done, done in my book, I thought he would have uh, had more success, basically. But this way, I just think it's... It, it wasn't productive. And that's what I meant by that statement. I, I also think that some of the people that he gave platforms to should never have been there. And, uh, <laughs> we can you know, list wanna, the names, yes. I don't want to list the names. <laughs> okay. But, sure. You know, so I really uh, I'll just list. wanted to... I wanted to stay far away from it. So that's sort of my take on it. But I didn't mean yeah. to offend anyone. I think there were some serious people there, and there were people there that made very good statements and did yeah. very well. I, I mean, I don't mean to denigrate the whole thing, but I just sort of think that when you taint it the way he has with these kinds of claims, it sort of taints the whole thing. And even though you had some good, serious people there, you know, you sort of lost it by um, – going out the way he did with it. And that's just my, you know, I, I always have felt very strongly about that. I've written about it. I've written articles about the importance of, uh, you know, being careful what you say. If you're trying to access uh, politicians or scientists, you just ha you cannot make claims like that. And I, I strongly take that position and I stand by that position. And I think if you look at the media coverage of this event, it bears out, it bears out what I'm saying, because there were a lot of ridicule pieces. And I, I believe that if he hadn't gone out like that with this extraterrestrial business, he would not have been ridiculed the way he was. That's just my, my perception, because I haven't been ridiculed. And I've never when I make, you know, the more kind of sane, balanced statements that I make, uh, I don't get ridiculed. You know, it just bothered me that he he's so stubborn about the way he does things. Well, you, you know, know, he's been on the Powercast several times. And I know Robert Hastings referenced one of those appearances, a particular portion of one show where he pretty much said he doesn't care. He plain right. doesn't care about vetting his people. He's looking for, I suppose, the most impact in terms of publicity, but not understanding getting the wrong publicity. This is what you encountered with the New York Times, the fact that they are looking for sound bites. In this day and age, you want to get the four or five words that seem most provocative and use those as the basis of the story. It doesn't mean they're not serious about what they wrote, and certainly I think the one from the New York Times was, but that's what happens. We'll get into more of that and get into a lot of, I hope, positive stuff coming up. Leslie Kane is joining us, and by the way, Charles Halt will be here in the second half of the show. Lots more to come with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. You know, the people we work with the most aren't always the people we see every day. Co-workers work on the go. Different offices. Clients are spread across the country, around the globe. You know, to work efficiently today, you need to have a stronger connection to your team to build trust and stay focused and brainstorm. And as you know, here on my radio shows, 
We've got people around the world that we deal with. Well, with GoToMeeting by Citrix, your entire team is just a click away. You can share the same screen and collaborate in real time. Tell me about it, even on your iPad. Try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit GoToMeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button. Use the promo code PODCAST. Remember, use the promo code PODCAST. Go to meeting. Meeting is believing. Friends, this is Alex Jones for MidasResources.com. For more than 15 years, I have exclusively used Midas Resources for all my precious metal needs. Whether it's bullion or collectibles you're looking for, Midas Resources is simply the best. I own my gold as a hedge against inflation. This Federal Reserve fiat currency could go the way of the Deutschmark and the Weimar Republic any time. In these historically dangerous times, it makes sense to physically hold gold and silver. Midas already has some of the best deals in the industry. But if you give them a call and mention the radio special, they will give you a list of the day's super specials. Midas brokers are standing by to answer all your questions at 800-686-2237. They also have a lot of informative free literature explaining the opportunities and risk of holding precious metals. They are ready to answer your questions at 800-686-2237. Again, that's 800-686-2237. What's safer and cheaper than prescription drugs? Glad you asked. The answer is renovation teas. Herbal remedies are much safer and much cheaper than prescription drugs. Taste great, and most importantly, herbal teas are effective and non-addictive. Renovation tea is especially unique, and here's why. We spent years researching herbs and their beneficial properties. Renovation Teas uses only 100% organic, fair trade herbs. Our teas are blended towards specific ailments and health conditions, such as diabetes, blood pressure, anxiety, libido, detox, and much more. All Renovation Teas are formulated and hand-filled in Arkansas. Take care of yourself naturally, the way Mother Nature intended. Order Renovation Teas at RenovationTea.com or call 870-784-3121. That's 870-784-3121. Renovation Tees. Renovate your health one bag at a time. It's time for a home security quiz. What effective home security device is smaller than a coffee cup, fakes out burglars into thinking someone is home at your house while you're away, plugs into any wall outlet, is recommended by many police departments, and sells for less than $30? Yes, it's fake TV. This year, about one in every 50 U.S. homes will have a break-in, with burglars usually picking the easy target, a dark house that looks like no one is home. Fake TV is a small electronic security device that makes it look like someone is home watching TV by simulating the light from a real TV. Fake TV could be the difference between coming home to a secure house or one that's been ransacked. To get your fake TV for only $29.95 with free shipping, go to faketv.com or call 1-877-5-FAKE-TV. That's 877-532-5388 or go to faketv.com. Fake TV, the burglar deterrent. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We have Leslie Kane joining us on the Paracast. She's an investigative journalist who has written a book about UFOs that is one of the rare bestsellers. And we were talking here about what I would say, Leslie, and you can disagree with me, about the need to be politically correct when you address scientists and government officials about UFOs. You don't assume facts, not in evidence, and maybe UFOs are ET. But unless you can prove that, you don't say it. You can say strange things are going on that we do not understand. But if you push things too far, they're going to just laugh at you. Am I getting this right? Yes, they're not. They're not going to. They're going to laugh at you, and they're going to run away. 
I mean, they may not laugh, but they certainly will not engage with you or take you seriously for one second. I, I don't understand why Steve doesn't understand that. It's such a simple thing to understand. And I, I, you know, I've dealt with these government officials for years, and I've dealt with government officials from other countries, both from Chile and France, which represent the best government agencies that exist you know, on this issue in the world. They wouldn't buy into this extraterrestrials engaging humans for decades and screaming and yelling about government cover-ups. I mean, anybody that does that is not going to be engaged by them. So, I mean, Steve has this philosophy maybe that he doesn't need government officials, but then he says he's trying to get to Obama. So, you know, who knows what, what's going on, but it's not rational. And yes, you have to be able to prove what you present. And when you're dealing with people who don't know anything about the subject, which is the vast majority of, of our political establishment, they don't know anything yeah. and they're not interested in UFOs. They could care less. A very you know, good they have point. Other things on their plate. And, you know, there's these fantasies that these people have about, oh, everybody knows about it and they're hiding it or they, they're going into the back rooms. I mean, Steve used to say that the Democrats have gone into the back rooms and decided that, that this is going to be the disclosure president and all this kind of stuff. And he makes these statements as if they were facts. It's just deceiving people, you know. I mean, I don't know where he gets this stuff. That's part of the problem with this field is there's too many people out there that are mirror gazing inside a bubble. And unfortunately, when you get a big uh, benefactor to come forward with, you know, seven figures sum, I think it, it kind of legitimizes and validates uh, that that navel gazing and, and sort of existing within the bubble. And your point is well taken. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just needed to throw that in there. Mm -hmm. Let's progress with this further. Now, okay. obviously, if we're going to be paranoid about it, we could say that someone like Stephen Bassett serves the interests of anyone who might be keeping a secret. Because you have somebody like him going on there and ranting about this, he's going to help keep secrets. So if that was the goal, if there are really secrets, that's not the way to get them. Well, that's sort of an irony, isn't it? It is. It is. I'm not going to say he's a disinformation <laughs> agent or not because we live in a paranoid culture. But I notice another way that some people who are very serious about the subject try to make it look more respectable is, one, you don't use the word UFO, which has that veneer of silliness about it. You know, Right, but that's I mean, very hard to avoid. It is yeah. very hard to avoid, but obviously scientists are using the term that NARCAP uses, for example, exactly. unidentified aerial phenomena. And years ago, APRO would insist on calling them unidentified aerial objects, UAO, which is similar. In other words, right. make it very specific. This is something that's going on that we do not understand. We can't necessarily explain it by conventional means. It deserves scientific explanation. And maybe the stench of UFOs carries over to certain people, so calling it something else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I respect the scientists who do that, and I thought seriously about it when I wrote my book, but I also realized that when you have any other acronym out there, people don't know what it is. So you'd have to have in the same line every time you use it, you'd have to explain it. Now, a scientist may not care because they're basically speaking to other scientists, but as a journalist and as somebody writing a book, I had to care that people know what I'm talking about, you know? So I decided to use it, but I, I completely respect and understand why people would choose to avoid the term. It's got so much baggage. I opened my book by trying to explain what a UFO actually is and properly defining it, which I wish everyone would do, of course. That might change some of the people's perceptions about it, but that doesn't, people don't do it. Everyone assumes a UFO is an extraterrestrial spacecraft by definition, but unfortunately, you know, that's not what it is. And that's one of the biggest problems in, in talking about the subject is that assumption. Very hard one to undo. Well, there was this survey that was done. It was sponsored by National Geographic when they had that Chasing UFOs TV series about which the less said the better. When yeah, two of your co-hosts say, we're going to disavow this show, you just know that it wasn't the best thing. But it did point out something that a third of the people that they surveyed believe that UFOs are spaceships. Now, understand if you go back to older surveys, as you probably know, back in the 90s and 80s, it was half the people in the United States. But still, that's the problem. UFOs are synonymous with spaceships. If you say... I think UFOs are real. Oh, you believe E.T. is here. Exactly. It goes exactly. without saying. 
And I have to constantly explain that to people when I talk about the subject, always, because that's, that's exactly right. The, the acronym means that to everybody. And so it just has to be stated over and over again that that's not what you're talking about. You can press a button in my, in my brain and I can, I've done it so many times, you know, but you have to do that. And of course, you know, the, the, the UFO crowd, the people that, you know, like at this event in Washington, I mean, nobody cares about that kind of careful delineation and rigor, the kind of rigor that's needed when you want to make a strong case on behalf of the evidence for, for phys- a physical phenomenon. I just don't think you can go further than that. Um, but that, that, that case can be made, but you have to do it properly, and then people will listen. It's funny, though, how the world has changed. Back in the early 50s, Captain Edward Ruppelt, who headed Project Blue Book, instead of calling them flying saucers, he said, we'll call them unidentified flying objects, which was meant to be the serious phrase. But Right. Yep. So, and the Air Force defined it. The Air Force wrote up a definition, you know, the U.S. Air Force. It was serious, yeah. And unfortunately, that that changed it changed into something else over time and we're stuck with that problem today i know that in those years of course the serious guy was someone like major kehoe who did say it outright he thought we were being visited by et but he tried in making the move to get congress to investigate he would give the important cases but he'd be very careful about the stuff that had unusual aspects to it. He'd stay away from UFO abductions, for example. Right. Not saying they're not true. In that case, we're talking about, say, Barney and Betty Hill in the 60s. The point being that that is such an extreme phenomenon that it's just going to turn a lot of people off, no matter how true it is. Exactly. It's not a matter of what's true and what isn't. It's a matter of strategy, the strategy that's going to get the job done that needs to be done. That's what's important. It's not about what anybody believes to be true or not true. Now, the biggest argument, I guess, is I'm going to ask you this, and we've got a lot of questions from our listeners, is how can we change that climate? Because obviously we have the baggage carried by UFOs, the expectations have been created through popular culture, through these reality shows, how do we get past that and move beyond it and really figure out what's going on? And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Leslie's book is called UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. This is a straight-ahead story. We'll have a lot more to come. Charles Halt joining us in the second half of the show with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first-class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one-click web apps such as WordPress, 24-7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to DreamHost.com slash radio, DreamHost.com slash radio. Whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. Hey there, my name is Frank Bates. Do you know the number one most valuable item in a crisis? Some people think the answer is gold. Others think it's a gun. But the correct answer will shock you. I just created a free video at Crisis123.com that reveals a surprising item that is more valuable than gold in a crisis. 97% of Americans don't have this one critical item. In fact, they haven't even given it a thought. And the sad truth is that you may not survive without it when a real crisis hits and a starving mob is right outside your door. What I have to tell you could literally make the difference between life and death for you and your family. Watch my video at Crisis123.com to discover the number one most valuable item in a crisis. You'll be shocked. See the controversial video that thousands of other smart patriots have already seen in the last three months. 
Go watch my video now at crisis123.com before they force me to shut it down. Again, that's crisis123.com. Are you still a traditional smoker? Now experience a new lifestyle and try vaping with e-cigarettes by LeSig. Imagine no ashes, stains, nasty smell, or coughing and hacking. With LeSig e-cigarettes, revolutionary microelectronic technology, rechargeable battery, and unique replaceable cartridge, you'll get all the benefits and satisfaction of smoking without the hazards. Choose your taste from a wide variety of our new American-made vaporeate e-liquids at LeSig.com. And LeSig smokes the competition by serving thousands of worldwide customers with real people customer service fast free same day shipping and a 30 day warranty and satisfaction guarantee so are you ready for a new vaping lifestyle then call 870-518-4307 that's 870-518-4307 or visit lesig.com spelled l-e-c-i-g.com lesig e-cigarettes for today's modern smoker This message dares all fish oil consumers. Yes, many people now take fish oil supplements, but the makers of K48 Plus want you to know it's not what you consume, but how it is absorbed that counts. So we dare you to compare fish oil with K48 Plus. K48 Plus, an omega-3 powerhouse, is made with the highest grade and most potent dose of krill oil available and is 48 times more easily absorbed than common fish oil. K48 Plus is both a remarkable anti-inflammatory as well as a powerful antioxidant. If you suffer from ailments such as diabetes, COPD, autism, arthritis, depression, migraines, lupus, Alzheimer's, glaucoma, joint pain, high cholesterol, memory loss, or Crohn's disease, you need to see the K48 Plus video at livepremium.net. That's L-I-V-E premium.net. Or please call 208-521-3601. That's 208-521-3601. And ask about K48 Plus. Restore hope. Optimize health with K48 Plus. This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. Leslie Kane joining us on the Paracast with Gene and Chris, Charles Halt coming in the second half of the show. And we were talking here about, let's face it, the need to be politically correct if you're trying to convince scientists, government officials, engineers, whatever, that there is a phenomenon worth investigating, that UFOs are not just conventional objects, you've got to be really careful about what you say and how you say it. And I guess the biggest problem now, Leslie, with all the baggage the UFO field has had over the past 50, 60 years, how do we overcome it? Can it be overcome? Well, I don't know if it can be, but we can certainly try. And, I mean, my approach to doing that has been really what I did in my book, which is to pull together high-level officials from around the world who do not ascribe to this sort of, you know, ufology approach or whatever you want to call it. But I've pulled together what I believe is the strongest evidence presented by the people who are not going to make claims beyond what they can prove and who take this approach and to just try to get that perspective out there and try to get it to the right people. I mean, I don't know what else to do. And I just sort of dissociate myself from the rest of the whole UFO scene. I mean, I'm a journalist. I'm not a ufologist or whatever they call it, or I'm somebody who's trying to present the best quality, most authoritative and well-documented information and bring the sources of that information at the the highest level sources that I can find and present it in a way that is acceptable to officialdom and then get it to them. And so, you know, all you can do is just keep plugging away at doing that. That's it. And, you know, one of the things I've done is my book and then this conference that's coming up, which we can talk about a little bit, is also another venue, you know, helping to provide a platform for people to make statements that are from this more official world and going on shows like yours and making statements that I feel are important to be made. I welcome those opportunities. But um, and so it's a hard road to climb. But um, I think progress is being made and I'm just going to keep at it. I don't know what else to do. Let's continue with this and let's look over the problems and the issues. So when you go to a scientist or military official to talk about this, do they kind of give you the third degree? Hey, you know, spaceships, flying saucers, who believes in that? How do you get past that? 
Well, I mean, I, it's not like I've sat down with a lot of military officials. You know, I have certain contacts, and I, I've condu- I conducted this briefing in Washington that, that John Podesta, we had kept this off the record, but John Podesta went on the record with that in the New York Times article that I was quoted in. You know, and that, that was a group of people in which what I did for that was I wrote up a briefing paper and presented my own assessment of why we need to take the subject seriously, and then I brought in four or five people to do this briefing with me, which the same way I did in my book. I like to give a platform to people like General Wilfred de Brouwer from Belgium or Dr. Richard Haynes, you know, people that I feel to be the authorities on this topic. You just present the information. And when I did this briefing, people listened and they were enthralled by it and they asked very intelligent questions. So, but if I had come in there and talked about extraterrestrials being here and that there's a government cover up and there's all these secrets being kept, you know, I wouldn't have been even to ha- wouldn't been able to have even had this briefing. So anyway, John Podesta has been sort of a link for me to that world, and um, he has great respect for the way I approach the subject and how I go about it. And that's the reason that he's in he's working with me is only because of that. And I think that shows the necessity of and the the value of doing it the way I do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I haven't had a lot of one on one meetings, but I think every meeting depends on who you're talking to and. You know, I just feel like I'm I'm one of the things I do know how to do is distill the information and, and create a, a briefing document or whatever is necessary, uh, it, which includes the, the kinds of information that should be stated at high levels. And I know how to eliminate the information that should not be stated. And again, it doesn't mean that that the other information isn't true. Or that, you know, whatever everybody has to say about this, people I you know, it might all be true, but the point is it doesn't work to bring that into the official world. You've just got to know what works and what doesn't work. Okay, let's just cover this very briefly because we have a lot of questions from our listeners. Leslie, okay, you're going into someone. Can you briefly state what sort of evidence you're going to present that's the most compelling to show them this is something that's worth further study? Yeah, I mean, I would. I first would make some statements about the overall issues about why it's important as a science, you know, that it's important as a scientific problem. It's important because there are aviation safety issues that are raised by it. And then I might cite some of the cases that have the most compelling evidence. I think the O'Hare Airport, I mean, the argument that I usually take is that we need a government agency in the United States, let's say just a staff person, even one or two people, to serve as point people on this issue, and I, I will I will outline what other governments are doing for, in other countries and show that they take it seriously and that these are the reasons why and that we need somebody to interact with those other governments. And that's sort of the, the point that I'm trying to make. And in, in making that point, I have to argue for it. So an example I love to argue on is the O'Hare incident from 2006. And to, to illustrate the kind of dysfunctional way that our government has responds to these does respond to these cases that case illustrates that very well the phoenix lights is another incident in which our government had no relationship it, whereas in other countries the official agencies would get very involved in these kinds of events and would inform the public about them so i i am very a lot of what i do is try to make the comparison with the uh, agencies from other countries And to just sort of highlight, not so much that there's something weird there, but that we have a phenomenon that's recurring and that we don't have any way within the United States structure of coping with it, of dealing with it, and that it really needs to be addressed. And that's sort of what I think is the most important point to make. If there's a single country out there that's doing it right, in your opinion, what country would that be? Um, I would say that Chile is doing it the best actually the best in the world. As far as I'm aware, I've spent, I went, I've been down there many times in the last year and actually have watched them work and have been briefed by the General Bermudez, who's the head of that agency. They have four full-time staff. They're in the process of getting a fifth person now. And their, their agency is situated within the equivalent of our FAA. And they are, they are just in it, what's incredible at this agency is, you know, they do great work, but it's the way they're plugged in with all the different government agencies, government departments, militaries, airports, aviation communities. They are completely plugged in throughout the whole country and accepted by the country, by every every branch of government. And they have regular meetings with, you know, the the Air Force commanders, high level officials in the Navy. And when a case comes up, 
they have a committee on hand which represents experts from all these different areas that will immediately jump in and provide whatever assistance is needed to investigate cases. Everybody takes it seriously there. And it's just a wonderful thing to observe. Um, you know, it's such an opposite extreme from what, obviously, from what we've got going on here. And what I intend to do is is try to write up a paper um, which I would like to be able to use in my continuing explorations and trying to get something like this to happen here. I'm going to write up a paper sort of describing how the Chilean agency operates because I do think it's exemplary for the world and I think it's a model that a lot of other countries could benefit from understanding. So that's, that's, I think, and then of course the French agency is very good too. They're smaller than the Chilean agency. I don't think they have the kind of support throughout the country that Chile, the Chilean agency has. So they may be a little more hampered, even though they have, uh, they, they want very much to do the work, but they're just a little more hampered, I think in, in France. So it's harder, but it, the support for the agency in Chile is just really impressive at the absolute highest levels, the absolute highest levels. And they're all, plugged in and they, as I said, they stop in for briefings from the office periodically. And when somebody has an incident, it immediately goes to that office without any question about it. Does the press in Chile cover this a lot too? They do. I mean, I think that the, the, the one thing about the agency there, it's called the CEFAA. They're very careful that they thoroughly investigate a case before it goes to the press. So sometimes there's a delay before the material goes out. And of course, there aren't that many really strong cases that come in, just like anywhere. Um, they'll get lots of calls and they get photographs all the time and stuff. But the ones that are really worth following up, um, you know, are not that common. Yep. Leslie Kane is joining us. We're going to have Charles Halt to discuss the Rendlesham incident and other topics. But right now with Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to MrUFO at WebTV.net. That's MrUFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. The government's Department of Homeland Security is buying up loads of ammo. At the same time, they're restricting civilians' rights to own and purchase firearms. Can you put two and two together? Infidel body armor can stop every round, including hollow points and 308 sniper rounds. Is reasonably priced and fully legal. But for how long? Go to InfidelBodyArmor.com, spelled I-N-F-I-D-E-L, BodyArmor.com. Infidel Body Armor just won't quit. We the people grow cotton, we fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit, then carting to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Hi, Ted Anderson. I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. The location, Denver Convention Center. Timeline, June 27th through 29th, 2013. The event, the Doomsday Expo. Our world and nation are changing. It's time for an educational experience that will enlighten you and the entire family. At the Doomsday Expo, June 27th, 28th, and 29th at the Denver Convention Center. Check out the latest survival products. Learn valuable survival techniques. Meet other preppers and meet guest speakers, including Dr. Joel Wallach, Scott Hunt, Jay Blevins, and more. Boost your knowledge with 
seminars on natural disaster preparedness, long-term prepping, survival gardens, self-defense, off-grid living, and financial planning. Ladies will get a valuable female perspective on family defense and preparedness. There's even a casting call for Nat Geo's Doomsday Preppers, and everyone will enjoy the first dry food cook-off. Tickets are just $14 for all three days and a Saturday evening concert. Mark your calendars for June 27th through 29th and get all the details at doomsdayexpo.com. Doomsdayexpo.com. Preparation starts here. A little over a year ago, I began to do a lot of research into why, even though I had a pretty good-sized meal, that I was still starving. And my research led me to a well-known fact that most of the soils that we grow our crops on here in the United States and across the industrialized world are almost completely depleted of almost all of the key minerals and trace elements that our bodies need to rebuild themselves, fight off cancer, and be healthy. I then searched out the best vitamin and mineral company out there and discovered Longevity. The Longevity products are designed to give you the real nutrition you need, and once you've got that, you don't have to eat as much to be satisfied. I've lost 37 pounds in two months simply getting the vitamins and minerals I need. Check it out for yourself. It's incredible. Go to InfoWarsTeam.com today and order your first canister of Beyond Tangy Tangerine Complete Multivitamin Mineral Complex Dietary Supplement. That's InfoWarsTeam.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned into the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? With Gene and Chris in the Paracast, we have Leslie Kane, investigative journalist, and she's been telling us about other countries where they take UFOs seriously, particularly the government of Chile. And later on, Charles Halt's going to tell us about Rendlesham and more this week in the Paracast. By the way, Leslie, you were telling me that the people from Chile are coming to the United States in late June to do a presentation before a conference. Tell us more. Yeah, I mean, I think that this upcoming conference is one of the most special aspects of it um, is that um, one of the top officials from the Chilean agency, as well as the top official from the agency in France, are both coming to speak at this conference which is on June 29th and June 30th, and I'll give the website about it. But the point being that these two guys from the leading agencies in the world have never spoken at a UFO conference in America or any conference in America before, and let alone never been at the same conference together. So as far as I'm concerned, I think this is one of the more exciting aspects about this. It's really historic that these two gentlemen are coming uh, to this event. And there's other speakers as well. And it's it's a conference that's a two-day event in Greensboro, North Carolina. And the website address is, it's the Center for UFO Research North Carolina, C-U-F-O-R-N-C. Or if people go to my Facebook page, which is just my name, I have links all over the place for this the website for this conference. And I really encourage people to check it out. Anybody that's near North Carolina, I really hope they will come. And it's just, I think it's a a rare kind of conference because it includes serious scientific people and um, including two PhD professors from universities in the United States. We've got Dr. Richard Haynes from NARCAP, who who rarely will go to a conference. So it's an opportunity to see him and General de Brouwer coming from Belgium to talk about the Belgian wave and, you know, one of the, there's going to be new information presented by these people too. For instance, the Belgian wave, you know, had that very famous photograph from Petit Rechin, which has since turned out to be a hoax, which was a, a terrible development a couple of years ago. So um, one of the things de Brouwer will do is update us on that situation. And who else is coming? Um, I'm just, of course, we've got Charles Halt. Charles Holt, of course, and he's going to give and he's, you know, there's there's constantly new information on the Rendlesham case coming out, which he's going to bring forward. And, and you know, many of the people coming, I think, will never have heard him before. So I think um, there'll be a lot of really great lectures and they're both, you know, exciting, but also very authoritative. I mean, you know, the information you're getting here is reliable. General uh, Parviz Jafari also from the 1976 incident over Iran, the dogfight over Iran, he is going to be coming and to talk about what it was like for him to be piloting an Air Force plane in 1976 when he was a gigantic UFO shot projectiles towards his aircraft and he lost control of his uh, his equipment at the last minute when he's trying to defend himself. So 
A lot of, uh, and he, he became a general afterwards. So we have, I think, a, a very great group of people, and it's a rare, a rare event, I think, in its kind of seriousness and also in its international aspect. It's being hosted and really produced by a man named Kent Center, who is has been involved with MUFON for decades, and he has actually has a serious problem with cancer right now. And this is sort of, he's got, you know, a, a terminal disease. And this is his, his great wish has been to produce a very serious UFO conference. And he's just working incredibly hard. And he's just unbelievable to me what he's been able to accomplish to make this happen. And it's really because of him that it's happening. So, and I've, I've basically just been a consultant for him, but he's the guy that's putting the whole thing together. We have to be grateful for all his hard work. I have the information here. It's going to be at the War Memorial Auditorium, Greensboro, North Carolina, Saturday and Sunday, June 29th and 30th. And according to this, you can actually go to Ticketmaster to order tickets, which makes it really easy because you don't have to even remember the site. You can just go to Ticketmaster and look it up or C-U-F-O-R-N-C.com. We'll have links over at theparacast.com or check Leslie Kane's Facebook site. To learn more and I'll about be there the also just to add this that I'll be there signing my book. And what's kind of amazing for people who you know like my book is that five of the contributors who actually wrote chapters in my book are going to be there. So it's an opportunity to get signatures from not just me and the book, but the, the, the incredible people who have written chapters for it and to get signatures from the uh, French and Chilean officials as well. So I think that's special. And also we have a science lecture Saturday night, which is a, a astronomer, astrophysicist, Jeffrey Bennett, who is not at all a UFO guy. He's coming in just to talk about the scientific search for extraterrestrial life and, and all the implications of that and what science is doing and what the Kepler satellites are discovering about exoplanets, all the Earth-like planets out there and, and that kind of stuff, which I find extremely fascinating. So that's sort of a special science lecture that we're having in the middle of the conference as well. Well, of course, if UFOs are ET, they really are ET. And obviously here at the PowerCast, we still say the jury's out as to what UFOs really are. We don't know yet. But if they are ET, certainly... It's become easier to accept because of the discovery of possible Earth-like planets around the galaxy. We have a bunch of questions, Leslie, of you and later on of Charles Halt, but I wanted to get a few of them in before we continue. Chris? Yeah, Leslie, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine um, a number of these questions together into kind of groups and, and sort of uh, generalize uh, the question uh, for the sake of brevity here. W- one thing that, that people are very interested in is uh, the last time that you were on the Paracast, um, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm, you talked about a, um, a some sort of a liaison program that uh, you thought would be a, a perfect way to possibly move this whole subject forward. How, how much progress have we seen uh, on this idea of creating uh, an, a liaison program? And, and who have you talked to? Um, obviously, you mentioned uh, Podesta. Uh, you, you've mentioned several people. Uh, do you want to give us kind of an update on how that particular effort is going? But yeah, by a liaison program, you mean a, a government office within the U.S. government? Correct. Is that or, what you or mean? just moving yeah. it moving it to to the next level of trying to uh get people to be on the same page with this. Obviously the government uh uh it would be the ultimate uh, coup if we could get some sort of program like they you described in Chile. But but have have you done any behind the scenes sort of uh moving and shaking in this regard because you are you are very well uh considered out there and um and I think a lot of people were very taken by your idea of creating this uh this some some sort of liaison program or or at least a, a, an approach to to take to the government with this yeah i mean i i what happened i did um you know had this briefing that we we mentioned earlier in 2011 and then there was the election so a lot of it sort of had to go on hold during the throughout the election process and now I am going to get back into sort of uh, trying to take some more steps in Washington. It's very much is behind the scenes, but basically it's just about networking with the right people and seeing if the right people are willing to go to the other right person that might be a little higher up and um, just exploring various ways in which such an, an, a staff person could actually be assigned. I mean, I, I, you know, even if we just had one staff person, within the, let's say the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, that was assigned to manage this particular issue. That would be a tremendous accomplishment, um, let alone an agency of, you know, four people. I don't expect that. But 
Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's a slow process. It takes a long time to get meetings and appointments with anybody of note, as as you all probably know. And so I am just sort of plugging away at it. And basically, um, I can hopefully report back to you after certain things happen, but not before. Well, that implies certain things might happen, which might. <laughs> might. <Let's hope. laughs> Do you think that the current circus in Washington, where they can't think about anything else more than the IRS, more than Benghazi or about the most troubling aspect of all tapping phones or checking out logs of reporters, do you think that's making it more difficult to get serious attention to other subjects? I don't know. I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I mean, I, I respect the fact that people in Washington and in government are have m- many, many important issues on their plate. Um, I suppose they also waste time with things that maybe people don't think are so important, but I don't think there anything's different in that regard. I mean, I'm not sure I completely understand what that question is getting at. Well, actually. maybe whether the fact that so much attention is being focused on all this scandal du jour or whatever, real or imagined, as opposed whatever. to something else, or right? Does I it mean, take it, does it take attention away from other pursuits? I I just don't know. I mean, I think it's par for the course that those things always go on. It's just part of the scene. Uh, whether it takes attention away from something else, I, I just I wouldn't know how to answer that. Sorry, I don't know. Maybe you guys can. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, don't it, get me started about politicians, boy. I'll I mean, tell there's you. always more going on than than one can ever imagine. You know, there, there's everybody's overwhelmed in Washington, and um, that's always the case. No matter what the issues are, there's always things going on. So I don't know, really. Well, maybe that, that makes sense. It. There's a lot of overwhelmed people in Washington that are underwhelmed I think so. uh, in terms of their performance. We're going to be that overwhelming be. our sponsors if I don't do this break. <laughs> Leslie Kane is joining us. We have Charles Hall joining us a little bit later with Gina and Chris. You're in. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Time and time again. You need to come here and help us. We need assistance. Please. Those we should be able to depend on let us down. Federal and state and local officials saying help is on the way. Will the folks here in Bell Harbor say show me? Don't depend on the government to save you. Take action now so that you're prepared for the next disaster with MyPatriotSupply.com. Get the best prices on storable food, non-GMO seeds, water filtration devices, home canning equipment, survival and self-reliance books, and more at MyPatriotSupply.com. Call 866-229-0927. We are hurting down here, and we need help immediately. Before it's time to survive, it's time to prepare. MyPatriotSupply.com. MyPatriotSupply.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. With Gene and Chris in the Paracast, Charles Hall joining us in a few more segments. Leslie Kane is answering your questions. Chris has mined through the various 
queries in our question bank area of forum.theparacast.com. He's trying to combine questions, keep them within a specific topic range so we don't get overwhelmed. Chris, what's next? There are some questions that have to do with your own personal beliefs around this or your intuition possibly around this this subject and here's a pretty good uh, question from ezekiel i think he he kind of hit the nail on the head on possibly how to pose this question to you what is your opinion in evolving around the uap subject or ufos where, where do you position yourself on a scale of one to ten one being the phenomena somehow originates from earth and ten being that it's extraterrestrial and has this this view or intuition or or kind of opinion has it shifted uh, since your book has come out? Um, well, no, I wouldn't say my opinion has shifted at all since the book has come out. Um, I mean, the more I learn, the more I realize that we have a real phenomenon that we can't explain. I can say that. But um, scale of 1 to 10, I don't know, maybe 50-50. You know, the point is that my personal beliefs are not really what's important here. I don't, you know, I'm just one person. I may have an opinion which is really no more valid than somebody else's opinion because it's just an opinion. What's important is what do we know and what do we not know about UFOs? And that's what I like to focus on. And, you know, I don't think what I happen to think they might be is that important in the scheme of things. Right. I know people want to know, but, you know, yeah. I, I'm just, I mean, <laughs> but I'm you're, you're a journalist and it's, you're supposed to be objective. So it's really hard for you to, I mean, you to know, come I out to and keep... say one way or another and without sounding like you're biased. I need to keep myself in the journalistic frame of mind when I'm talking publicly about this the subject. That's just the way it is, you know. Well, here's another question from Ezekiel, and this is a good one. Uh, it has to do with these deathbed confessions, uh, the Philip Corsos out there. There was a bit of a buzz around uh, Richard Dolan's video of this uh, new anonymous source that's come forward. Evidently, he had contacted Linda Howe back in the early to mid-90s. Uh, she called him Cooper uh, or Cooper. What do you make of these types of claims? And, and, and do you think that, you know, this whole idea that they're asserting is that the executive branch isn't being briefed on extraterrestrial, quote unquote, affairs? And do you think people like Corso and this Cooper should be excluded from the conversation? Uh, should we somehow vet these people better before we sensationalize their claims? Uh, how do you where do you come down on that? Well, I mean, as a journalist, the problem I have with the claims is that it's one person telling a story that they can't back up. Yes, it might be fascinating. And yes, it might even be true. But if they don't, if they can't corroborate it in some way with some, you know, by by other witnesses or through documents or whatever, it's not useful. I just can't make use of it as a journalist because it's, it's just one person telling a story. And so it's not something you can really bring to the table if you're trying to make a case for UFO evidence and, you know, there's no way to know whether the guy is legit or not really. And if he can't back up what he's saying, so you, there you're, you're stuck with a story and that's it. I, there's certainly not something that I work with within the realm of material that I consider to be important, but it doesn't mean I don't find them interesting, but so, you know, so you can't do anything with it. Well, I think one of the arguments people will make is why would they say this on their deathbed? knowing their time is short or almost non-existent, if it wasn't true. I think that's the only yeah. argument you could say. But as you say, if there's no evidence, it's just somebody's story. Maybe something for and their you know, family to talk about when they remember and them. It could very well be true. I think it's fascinating, but what can you do when you can't prove it? That's the well, point. Well, I mean, a journalist requires confirmation and then a third uh, generally a third confirmation before yeah. before a good journalist will run with any sort of claim or story. And so need does, at least two, two, two other sources. Right. And so does a member of the political establishment who doesn't even accept that UFOs are real. Yeah, you know, to accept a deathbed confession talking about alien bodies, you know, what are they, they're just, they can't relate to that unless you can prove it. So, you know, that's why I, I don't mean to disrespect those confessions I and mean, they could very well be true. I have no way of knowing. But I can't really make use of them. That's the problem. I I don't know, Leslie, if you had a chance to see the wrap up uh, the final day of the citizens hearing on disclosure. But I've stated on the show that I thought uh, Paul Hellyer, the former Canadian minister of national defense, his sort of uh, presentation at the end or his opinions at the end were, uh, I thought, the low point of the whole thing, quoting 
uh, a questionable abductee and his conversations with aliens and what the aliens are telling us and this sort of thing. And, and then making the claim that there are four different species running around the planet on Earth. Ezekiel wants to know what you think of, of, of that particular way to sum up that, that event. And, uh, and, and how do we curb certain you know, high-powered individuals' enthusiasm once they do get involved in this? I mean, how, how can we get them not to uh, become more of a, of, of a source of the problem here uh, with acceptance of this subject? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I watched the hell year, and I was absolutely shocked, to tell you the truth, that that he with what he was saying, I just couldn't believe it. That he would, and that he was being given a platform to say those things in Washington. Yeah, you know, it was just I was very surprised, and I, I, what can I say? I mean, I think it was entirely inappropriate for him to make statements like that at a, in Washington D.C., et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I was just really, really surprised. And the only way I think we can curb it is to just not provide platforms to people who are going to make statements like that and to be, you know, require that before people become part of an event that we know what they're going to say, you know, to have some control who's ever organizing the thing um, so that inappropriate material is not presented. I mean, that's the only thing you can do. And obviously in the citizens hearing, there were absolutely no restrictions. Anybody could just come in and say whatever they wanted. Uh, and yeah, I, I was... I have to say, I was just stunned when I when I heard Hellier. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, the guy is very old. He's old. Oh, uh, I, I know, tell you, I was trying to tickle my nose so I could come up with the with the old vaudeville. Boosh. <laughs> I really. I, I mean no disrespect. I was. I was Mr. really going to just. I, I. I was hopping mad st- standing there, just a few feet away from the table. <laughs> I, I was at the entire thing, filming it uh, for the streaming, and I was incensed. I could not believe it. I saw people in the audience just rolling their eyes, going, "Oh no!" Holding their heads. No, I couldn't believe it. I and I. I think and I remember that. I think that the uh, panel eventually had to tell him his time was almost up because he was going on and on. He started to quote Bin Laden, didn't he? He started talking about 9-11 and bin Laden, I think. I know. It, it just I was, was all over the up. place. And, you know, I, I just, I, with all due respect, it just was inappropriate for this, for that to have happened. I mean, what can I say? They <laughs> lost control. Before we lose control, another question, Chris? Yeah. This is a really good one. And I'm, I'd be very interested to hear uh, about the response to your book since it's been out. This comes from Artie Um, who's a longtime poster here at the forum, theparacast.com. And, and he's given your book a five-star rating uh, at Amazon, just absolutely loves it. And he says, since the book was written and published, what impact do you think that it's had on people's perceptions? And what sort of feedback, basically, have you been getting uh, from people well, thanks a lot to to him. Um, I continue to get very positive feedback, but I mean, especially on Facebook, you know, people keep writing. It's plus it's been translated into like eight languages around the world, so it's it's getting more and more play in other countries, including China and Brazil and some pretty big countries, Germany. Um, and I think what matters the most to me is when somebody says to me, which happens quite frequently. That so and so who they know was a total skeptic about this issue. This one woman just wrote me on Facebook actually. She said, My husband has never he's always thought this issue was bunk. And he read your book and he's now completely changed his position. Um and I think that's really this book is useful for persuading people who would otherwise not take the subject seriously but when they're just exposed to what's out there all over the internet, you know. And that makes that's really satisfying to me and I think it continues to happen that people are continuing to read it. It's still selling fairly well on Amazon and that it's still influencing people and um that makes me very happy and you know, I do get also quite a lot of letters from witnesses, people that want to share sightings with me. Sometimes they're military people. Uh, that have never really felt comfortable or never felt they had anybody before that they felt comfortable talking about this with. So, I mean, that happens to me quite a lot. We'll have Charles Hall joining us after the next segment. Leslie Kane with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a -a thrill-a-minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. 
But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Hi, this is Gary Cooper with Midas Resources Gold and Silver. Don't be surprised when the global elite confiscates money from your bank account one day. They have already very clearly telling you that they're going to do it. With what just happened in Cyprus serving as a blueprint for future bank bailouts, if you are concerned about keeping your money, why not consider storing your wealth in gold and silver? Call me, Gary Cooper, at 1-800-686-2237, extension 130. Together we'll discuss your options of buying gold and silver. Again, the global elite have plans for your money and it doesn't include you. So call me, Gary Cooper, at 1-800-686-2237, extension 130, and I will send you a booklet with 10 reasons why gold and silver could be right for you. Again, don't get caught with money in your account when the next bank bailout hits. Call me, Gary Cooper, at 1-800-686-2237, extension 130. The 9th Annual Health Freedom Expo returns June 7th through June 9th at the Schaumburg Convention Center in Schaumburg, Illinois, featuring over 75 world-renowned doctors, activists, and experts. Meet Dr. Joel Wallach, author of Dead Doctors Don't Lie, actress and activist Daryl Hannah, famed Dr. Patch Adams, woman's health expert Dr. Joan Borisenko, GMO activist Jeffrey Smith, and renowned natural health doctor Dr. Joseph Mercola. Sample delicious healthy foods, watch award-winning documentaries, attend exciting panel discussions, discover the latest natural health products and be sure to check out the expo hall filled with 200 exhibitors don't forget about the new interactive pavilions and receive free screenings it's all here under one roof for only 20 dollars a day or 45 dollars for the entire three-day weekend it costs less than a doctor's visit but hurry tickets are going fast for tickets and info visit healthfreedomexpo.com or call 888-658-3972 the health freedom expo your one source for total natural health solutions Did you know that gold and silver contain healing properties? It's true. Since the beginning of mankind's history, gold and silver have not only been used as real money, but also for healing our minds and bodies. Utopiasilver.com is your leading source for colloidal silver and colloidal gold, offering supplement protocols that can heal and enhance your health. Protocols for boosting the immune system, insomnia, yeast infections, herpes, and countering the effects of vaccinations and radiation poisoning. And now Utopia. Utopiasilver.com encourages the use of real money with this buy one, get one free real money special. For details and your colloidal silver and colloidal gold supplements, call 888-213-4338 and ask about 50% off for first-time customers. That's 888-213-4338 or visit utopiasilver.com, utopiasilver.com, fighting for liberty and healing one American at a time. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Leslie Kane joining Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. By the way, Leslie will be one of the featured speakers before this UFO conference, which is scheduled for... June 29th and 30th, sponsored by the Center for UFO Research in Greensboro, North Carolina. We'll remind you about everything a little bit later in the show. Charles Hall joining us in the next segment, where we focus on Rendlesham. Chris, more questions? Sure. Uh, Gene, this one comes from um, Ellen Dill, who's a longtime poster at the forum.theparacast.com. And this involves that really interesting uh, controversy surrounding the military parade down in Santiago with what some people feel were two objects flying by. Have you heard any sort of developments on the analysis of that film? And what, uh, you know, what can we take from that? Was it just a couple of insects flying by or were they actually high strange objects uh, traveling at hypersonic speed? 
Well, that's it's a really interesting question, as in, and I've been fascinated by that case. And in case your questioner probably knows that I have three articles about it on the Huffington Post website. So I hope anybody who's curious will go there and read those articles. You know, the, the essence of that case is really that it's not solved because there's probably been about five or six scientists between the scientists in, in Chile and two scientists in America who did in-depth studies of that footage. They all have different conclusions, which I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, some think it's it definitely could not possibly be an insect, that it was anomalous, some kind of anomalous object, and they state their reasons why. And others state uh, they think it was most likely an insect, and here's why. So uh, we're, it's, it's a mystery, and I think um, people have to make up their own minds, basically. I mean, in, in my opinion, if you look at a video of an insect flying, which I have put inside one of my Huffington Post stories, a beetle, which is what it would most likely have been because it had kind of a curved back. And I talked to all these entomologists about it, too. And I said, if this was a, an insect, what species would it be in Santiago at this time of year? And the only one they could come up with was this tiny little ladybug, which was, you know, it's a, smaller than the fingernail of your pinky. And I looked at videos of what this ladybug looks like when it's flying. And it has this contraption over its head that's that's up there all the time, even when its wings are flapping. And you have to you have to go on my article, but it doesn't look at all like the the thing at Santiago. So who knows? I mean, I you know I think it's uh, it's just a fascinating case because the video is so f clear. We have great stills of this object. The object showed up in two different flybys, looking exactly the same at the same angle even to the camera. Uh, you know, the likelihood of it being an insect to me doesn't seem high, but I'm not a photo analyst, so I'm going to defer to the analysts who have, have studied the footage. And um, as I said, their conclusions don't always agree. So there we are. That's true. Let the, let the experts uh, come up with the analysis and uh, conclusions on that. And I, I agree. I think we should leave uh, some of this work to the professionals uh, who <laughs> I think we need more of in this field. I, I don't think there's enough quality analytical uh, people involved in this field. That's my own personal opinion, uh, with the exception of Bruce Maccabee, Jeff Sanyo, and a couple of others. I mean, there's there's really... Right. Nobody that you can really go to. In, in well, in this case, so we had Bruce McAbee and Richard Haynes. Both did in-depth studies right. of that footage, and they're both posted on their websites. And I, right. I wrote an article which sort of summarized their findings. And the interesting thing is that they came up with different conclusions looking right. at the same material. So yep. <laughs> I guess it's still an anomaly, the object. You could say yeah, that. Yeah, well, that's true. It's controversial. But the question and, uh, is whether it could be a bug. And I think if you go and look at some, some images, of bugs, but bugs, you know, there's a lot of stuff about what it would look like if it really were a bug. I personally don't think it looks much like the object that in question, but again, I have to defer to the people who studied it. So, well, if, if it's real, uh, it, it definitely uh, does say something about the brazenness of the phenomenon. It, it, it's willing to go anywhere and do anything at any time. Boy, I'll tell you, there was a lot of, a lot of hardware <laughs> present that day. Yep. It, it, Leslie, here's another question that, uh, again, you know, we at the Paracast pride ourselves in having as well-rounded a listening audience as, as a show like this could possibly ever want. We do have a lot of skeptical people that uh, tune into our show because we do attempt to be as objective as possible about the subjects we cover here. And and that this question has come up several uh, in several different ways on uh, at the forum.theparacast.com. And that is, how would you dis respond to the old debunker's question? Why don't we in this day and age with so many cameras and cell phones around have any clear footage of UFOs or related phenomenon? And this goes right to the to the last question of of you know the sort of ephemeral way that these things show up we don't have any clear concrete cut and dried evidence and why is that with all these cell phones and and cameras around now yeah i mean it's a, it's a great question and i think the point is we do have some very good and very clear photographs of ufo's that have been analyzed in labs i mean i've got some of them in my book but let's say we've got maybe five or six that are really we really really seem to be legit one of the reasons i think is that when a witness is observing a ufo and i've talked to so many people who have told me the same thing if they see something going by and they're like totally awestruck they're staring at it they don't want to take their eyes off it they know that they only have like 15 seconds and the thing's going to be gone the last thing they think about is trying to find their camera or or, you know, take a picture of it. They're just too fixated on it. I think that's 
one of the reasons. But I, again, nowadays we have people with cell phones right in their pockets. So I think there are a lot more pictures and videos being taken. I mean, I see things every day, you know, that, that people post and so on. The problem is, so you have a video of something. First of all, none of them are, are spectacular close-ups, you know, of what we'd really want, of some physical craft that's really obvious. But even the ones that are decent, there's nobody to analyze them. I mean, they, they just get thrown up on the Internet. One person has vide videotaped something, and it's like, what can you do with that kind of thing? So I think it's a combination of things. But there certainly are a lot more people taking videos now and taking photographs. And I'm just sort of waiting for one to come along. That, you know, but the, the UFOs don't come that close. You take out a cell phone, the camera, the quality is not going to be very good. Right. That's the other problem. Yeah, that is a problem. Uh, it's just not going to be good. I mean, and so, you know, maybe one day this is going to be a low-flying UFO because people do see them sometimes very low down. But they're usually just so freaked out or awestruck or terrified or whatever that they don't take a picture. In addition to that, sometimes uh, they'll they'll even have a, a malfunction or the, the battery will all, all of a sudden be dead. I, I hate when that happens. Right. <laughs> or the um, the picture will just be... A blaze of light, or it'll be, you know, the radiation will ruin the image, like what happened with Jim Pennison's picture of the object at Rendlesham. I mean, maybe the picture doesn't come out. It's a very legitimate question. I puzzled by it myself. I think there are all these reasons, but it still seems like there should be something. We do have great pictures, though. I mean, I, when people say we don't have them, they're, they're all fuzzy. The debunkers always like to say, we have nothing but fuzzy pictures of lights in the sky. Well, that isn't true. And the, the, the photograph from Costa Rica is an example. Um, that I think is one of the best photographs we've got. And it's absolutely legit because it was taken by from a government airplane, government mapping plane in Costa Rica. And it's crystal clear, crystal clear, because it was on a large negative. And I, I, this, I don't know if you're familiar with the picture, but I have it in my oh, book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it you know, a map, just, it was a mapping uh, yeah. uh, with an automatic camera that was featured Looking in a down. couple of Jacques Vallée's books. Yeah, um, there exactly. is some question that, uh, about good, it, though. There are good photos. There are? Yeah, yeah. Ray Stanford has looked at it and thinks he's come up with a possible explanation for it. But but it is. You're right. It is crystal clear. And uh, we should be able to glean some really good information from it. Uh, I'd like to see more uh, analysis done on that and, and somebody really – really take that image apart. Valet and Haynes did a, did a study on it, but I don't, yeah. I don't know if there's... I, I'm interested in to know what Ray Stanford's was. Yeah. Okay, we have Charles Hall coming up in our next segment with Leslie Kane, with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com there's been a disaster, and most of you don't even realize the serious concern for all of us. Alex Jones has warned you for years to get the most important supply you can for your liberty, freedom, and security, and that's food. We thought the danger was drought, or food diverted to our gas tanks, or food so expensive that we'd all need financial assistance to afford it, or our food being sold to other countries. But here's the most effective way you'll lose your liberty and security without a fight. Government regulation. The the do-it-yourself public services of many LDS Mormon food storage canneries can no longer be provided. This, along with the recent private gardening and farming regulations and additional government control of food supplies and resources, says food is the ultimate priority. eFoods Direct will provide free shipping on all food orders until further notice. Call 800-409-5633 or on the web eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex. 
We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. Hello? Congratulations. For what? For losing all that weight. How'd you do it so fast? ASAP. ASAP what? What's that mean? Are you ready to get as skinny as possible, as soon as possible, as simple as possible, and as sexy as possible? I'm listening. Then get with the ASAP program. It's real and it works. No smooth talk, no slick advertising, and no exaggerated claims of success. I've got to know more. Welcome to ASAP, as slim as possible. Whether you have 10, 20, or 50 pounds to lose, ASAP is your weight loss answer. ASAP targets the abnormal fat reserves and makes them available to be burned as fuel and contains no caffeine or hormones. Order ASAP at wholesale prices or join the team to share the business with others. Visit GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. Lose weight and look great with ASAP, as slim as possible. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We're joined this segment on the Paracast with Gene and Chris by Colonel Charles Halt. We're going to ask him some key questions about the Rendlesham case, and also we're going to ask your questions from the audience. Leslie Kane stays on. And she's going to contribute some of her observations and maybe a few questions. Colonel Halt, welcome to the PowerCast. Well, thank you. We're glad to have you here after all these years. And I think the first question to ask, because a lot of our listeners have heard about the Rendlesham case, are there things you can tell us that people tend to get wrong or don't understand about the case? How much time do you have? Uh, well, there's, so we'll... Much misinformation and dis- <laughs> there's so okay. much misinformation and disinformation out there. A lot of skeptics don't know or understand the whole scenario, I guess, is the best way to put it. And they shoot from the hip. Well, let's do our best, okay? Okay. So give us a few key areas where we're getting it wrong about Rendlesham. Well, I keep hearing this lighthouse stuff. You know, I could see the lighthouse. The lighthouse was visible once we got to the edge of the farmer's field. It was off to the right about 30 degrees. I saw the object in the field between myself and the party I was with and the farmer's house. And the object was glowing brightly and reflecting off the windows of the light of the farmer's house, which was on our side of the house. There's no way the, the lighthouse could have reflected light off the windows. Okay, There's now no that is, of course, Colonel Hall, a common skeptical impression of the episode. That's yeah. what they've been claiming, that it's a lighthouse. Yeah, well, do you ever see a lighthouse move through the forest? Well, not this trees? year, but I understand that works well on TV with special yeah, effects. I'm sure it does. Okay, how about another misconception of Rendlesham? Well, there's a lot of confusion because the primary witnesses from the first night were brought in and, how shall I say, interrogated with hypnosis and sodium pentothal, or that's what they assume it was, some type of an injection. And between what happened to them there and in the forest, they are so confused today that I'm not sure they know which ends up. Which particular witnesses are we talking about? I'm talking about, I don't even want to call them a witness, Larry Warren, Jim Penniston, and John Burroughs. So you're saying basically what they report, and we've had Burroughs on the Paracast a couple of years back. The things they remember, they're misremembering because of the sodium pentothal and because of the hypnosis? Or because of what happened to them in the forest. Or quite possibly later they had regression hypnosis. I don't know. I know the stories have changed, locations have changed, all sorts of things have changed. Well, that becomes particularly discouraging. 
It certainly is. It's very frustrating. Give me a couple of examples here. What specific things can we point to that they are misremembering that you know to be other than what they say? Several times Jim Peniston and I and John Burroughs were back on location there doing some filming and working with some producers on certain productions. We always went to the same site that I was taken to the first time I went into the forest. Several, three or four years ago, Jim and I were back with MPH doing a production for them, and he went out the east gate and took us to the right about, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred yards, oh, a half a mile, quarter mile from the original site, and swore that was the right site. And he said, this is what the trees looked like when we were there. Well, Vince Turkettle, who was the forester at the time the incident occurred, was with us. And Vince said, these trees are only 25 years old. It couldn't have been here. Well, I already knew that, but I didn't say much. But just one example. If you look at Jim Notebook, the notebook didn't appear until about 25 or 30 years later. Recently, I've run across someone who met the gentleman that rode on the bus back from the site with Jim when Jim came in from Gardmont back to the base. And Jim described what happened and pulled his notebook out and drew a sketch in the notebook. I remember Bertolino, Bertolino. There was nothing else in the notebook that he could see. The date in the notebook is dated, an incident occurred, time and date are wrong. It has it on the 27th of December, not the night of the 25th, morning of the 26th. There's a whole lot of inconsistencies. Something happened to them. There's no doubt about that. That's well documented. But, you know, things have changed. They've been, how should I say, had. Well, that's a good question here, too. Do you think it's the government investigators who screwed the pooch, as they say, or do you think it's the nature of the phenomenon they encountered that impacted their memories? I can't answer that because I don't know. Maybe a combination thereof. I, I don't really know. How did your superiors handle your particular experiences here? How did they treat you? Uh, I didn't have any real problems. I was kind of in shock, you know, anticipating the worst, I guess, is the best way to put it. Uh, no, they believed me, and uh, we kind of just put it to bed, if you know what I mean. I wrote the memo to the Ministry of Defense. That was not supposed to be released. And uh, as far as we were concerned, it all went away, which it did, and it reappeared three years later. Well, the other issue to ask about there, did it impact your career? in the Air Force? Fortunately not, because it, the intervening three years I got promoted. I'm certain if it had come out and I'd made the papers and there'd been a big splash about it, I probably wouldn't have been promoted. There's a stigma that goes with this. Once you get involved in something like this, it's sort of like a tar baby. You touch it, you don't ever get rid of it. I think a lot of us have had that feeling. Now, I, I never wanted to get involved. Baby. I did everything I could to keep it from being released. When I got the call from the acting 3rd Air Force commander, Pete Bent, saying, we're going to have to release your memo, I begged him not to. And I told him, your life and mine will never be the same. Please don't release it. Burn it. Those are my exact words to him. And his answer was, I've got to release it. Wow. Yeah, I wasn't seeking this to become public. I, it just, it's one of those things I didn't need. Yeah, so so that, that definitely is, uh, you would not have... Uh have come forward unless you had been outed, in other words? We wouldn't be talking now. Right. What do you think of uh, Peniston's claim of uh, touching the object and uh, being downloaded with 12 pages of binary code? Uh, th this comes out years later. I've always kind of scratched my head about that one. Well, where do you come down on that? Well, I, I took the original statements from him, and he didn't mention anything about that. But you have to keep in mind, he was in shock at that time. They all were. He was so nervous, I'm telling you, he, he just was, he, all he wanted to do was get away from it. Uh, it's possible that uh, he was worked on and uh, part of it was fabricated. It's part that they may have covered part of it up. I don't know. I wasn't present. I do know there was a concerted effort to contain it, I guess is the best way to put it, and then at a later stage to discredit it. Yeah. Well, that that goes with the territory, no question about it. Uh, that, do we We've see even that had pattern? a person come forward on Coast to Coast Radio and in correspondence with one of my friends who's been working with me on putting some stuff together on it and claimed to be Joe Wilson, who was assigned there from Hurlburt Field with special classified ground effect radar and this, that, and the next thing. And he was out in the field, and he mentioned working with me, and, and he knew it awful lot about what was going on at the base and who was there and whatnot, but there was no Colonel Wilson there. There is no Colonel Wilson. I've done a lot of research on that. He mentions names of other people that don't exist, too, and more disinformation. Oh, boy. 
Well, we've got a we've got a lot of questions from our our listeners uh, who are fascinated, obviously, with the Rendlesham case, uh, being probably one of the key cases uh, in the annals of this subject. And uh, one one question uh, has to do with uh, radar track data, um, and and also the scrambling of of fighter aircraft from from uh, nearby bases. Um, we really haven't heard much about uh, the actual real time response in terms of scrambling planes, uh, that sort of thing, uh, actual radar track data. Uh, to your knowledge, I mean, uh, what, what sort of smoking gun scientific data do we have in, in that regard? And and how do you address uh, the lack of uh, planes being scrambled? Well, I can't answer for the planes. I can tell you this. I was in constant contact with the command post through the radio net. We did have difficulties with communications, but I was pretty much in contact with them, describing what was going on, what I saw, asking them to look in the sky, asking them to contact RF Watersham, which was Eastern Radar, we called it. They had air defense for our sector. I asked them to call the tire, and they even called Heathrow. And everybody came back and said to me from the command post, uh, they don't see anything. Well, later, I find, years later, that RF Watersham did pick up something on their radar. They did have a track that dropped into the forest. And later when the air traffic controllers at Bentwaters, and they've come forward with signed sworn statements now that they're retired, that they visually saw the object, they watched it, they saw it go across the scope at high speed, they saw it drop into the forest where we were. How about that? We got to do our break. How about that? Colonel Charles okay, Hall. your break. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, we have permission now from the colonel. Colonel Charles Hall joining us with Leslie Kane and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Virtually anyone can hack your cell phone and track your calls, your texts, your emails, your every movement, but only if they can detect a signal. Stay one step ahead of hackers and Big Brother with a block at Pocket, a custom-made pocket infused with pure silver that creates a complete Faraday enclosure for your cell phone. For free shipping to the lower 48, visit BlockItPocket.com or call 888-315-9618, BlockItPocket.com. Enhancing health and privacy. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Hi, Ted Anderson. I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800 800- 6862237 Being prepared against possible food shortages and economic collapse is not complicated. Just remember two words: disaster stuff. Add.com after those two words and you've got just one site for all your preparedness needs. Disasterstuff.com prepares your family against food shortages with Linden Farms freeze-dried foods in buckets or gourmet reserves. Freeze-dried food in number 10 cans, both with free shipping. Purify and rid your water of contaminants with a big Berkey or other Berkey system and get free shipping plus a water level spigot or fluoride filter at cost and protect your radios and other electric from EMPs with our EMP Faraday bags starting at just $5.90. When the food shortages and economic instability happens, be ready with all your stuff from disasterstuff.com. Just remember two words, disaster stuff. 
Bedfuchs.com. Freedom through self-reliance and personal responsibility. Pharmacist Ben Fuchs knows the importance of proper digestion. Make sure you take a look at the ultimate enzyme product. They're made with bile salts and fat digestion enzymes and protein digestive enzymes. And not only do the ultimate enzymes give you obvious benefits for digestion, but they can also help keep your blood flowing through your circulatory system. As most of you probably know by now, thick, sludgy, clotting blood is a serious risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Clearly, inappropriate and excessive blood clotting is a major health issue, and thick, sludgy blood is not just about heart health either. Sludgy blood can compromise oxygenation and nutrient delivery to all your cells and tissues and organs and ultimately lead to almost any health issue you can name. Concerned about proper digestion and heart health, order Ultimate Enzymes by calling 866-735-2470. That's 866-735-2470 or on the web at brightsidebed.com. That's brightsidebed.com. Order today. Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. We continue with Charles Halt. One of the key figures in the Rendlesham UFO case, we have Leslie Kane, investigative journalist with Gene and Chris in the PowerCast. Before we go on, Leslie, you have any comments to offer or questions of Colonel Halt? Not really. I mean, I'm, I'm utterly fascinated by, of course, what he's saying, and I'm just sitting here listening. So I, I can't think of, I think the questions you guys are asking them, him is great. The recent developments of the radar people coming forward that he just mentioned is, is really, really significant, really significant. I mean, Chuck, the reason they didn't come forward earlier was because you mentioned that they were retired after they well, came forward with this, that they just feel that, that they couldn't do it because they've been told they, not to? Or? Their statements are that at the time when they saw it, they said to each other, we didn't see anything because they had had experience with other controllers who reported UFOs and had gotten decertified. And to get decertified as an air traffic controller is to kiss the death. In other words, that's the mm. end of your career. Wow. There was also an officer in the tower, and I know who he was. He doesn't want to come forward. He doesn't want to talk, but he was a supervisor of flying. Now, what was he doing in the tower at 2 a.m. in the morning or whatever time it was, 1.32 o'clock in the morning, when we weren't flying and hadn't flown? What was he doing with a command radio? He had a command radio. Some good questions. Wow, very good question. Well, where did that data end up? Do you know, uh, is it still under some sort of veil of secrecy? Uh, is there any way that we can do an what, FOIA? What, what, what that, what that what data are you talking about? Uh, the, the Air Force tracking data. Uh, there's no record of it now other than what the air traffic controllers. They just think they remember it because of what was going on. They remember us going into the forest. They knew there was some activity because the gentleman and the, the officer in the tower, the major in the tower with them, had the command radio on, and they could hear me over here, me talking to the command post. So they knew some of the things that were going on. How about the local uh, UK police? Have you uh, were they uh, interviewed by Air Force personnel? Uh, do you, I, you don't hear much about the locals' response in, uh, in terms of law enforcement. The locals, when they did come out, they were out at least two on two occasions, perhaps more. And what I'm told, because I wasn't present, when they saw the indentations in the ground that were supposedly made by the craft when it landed, they said, "Looks like rabbit scratching or hens nesting." Well, you don't get three indentations in hard packed, nearly frozen silk clay or uh, sandy soil in the winter time that are equal distance apart and all identical. They didn't want anything to do with it. It's the old, hey, I didn't see anything. Wow. I, I, this comes from our, our uh, sometime panelist, uh, Gogs Mackay in Scotland, a longtime poster here at the theparacast.forum.com. Uh, are you being prevented from revealing more about Rendlesham duty or security oath, is there are there things that you literally can't can't uh, go public with? Uh, no, not actually. Now, if you ask me some technical questions or what was on the base, there are some areas where I can't go. But when I left the military, I had a very high class, classification. My security clearance is way beyond top secret. I was debriefed, and a lot of things I can't talk about, but nothing that really pertains to this particular incident. I specifically ask. What about the Benzwaters incident and what occurred there? And the debriefer said, huh? And I said, well, there was a supposed UFO incident in 1980 and so on and so forth. And they said, and they shrugged their shoulders. Wow. That's surprising. I didn't answer one of your earlier questions. You asked me about aircraft being launched. We had no capability at the base at the time. We had the A-10s there. Uh, there were fighter aircraft at Milton Hall and Lake and Heath in different places. I don't know if any of them were on alert, I, you know, because I can't speak for that. I know nobody got into the air. 
Yeah, you would think with the actual radar tracking data of some sort of incursion like that, that, that that's the first thing that would no, happen. the command post didn't know because the tire said they don't see anything. They don't know anything. And Eastern Radar didn't say anything. So they yeah, had no knowledge. Shouldn't this have, have shown up on uh, on the Brits radars, uh, Mendenhall well, and other? Apparently it did, but the, they didn't make any issue of it. So they called you guys and said, hey, you know, what's going on over there? And, and they got they, they no, got they an all clear signal. No, no. They later, one of the controllers later admitted that he saw something on the screen. But there was no mention, and I didn't learn this until several years later. Okay, I, I understand. Well, um, what do you make of the of the MOD maintaining that UFOs in general and the events at Rendlesham were of no defense significance? When somebody with any, with any brain cells can see that they're su- supremely uh, relevant. Again, this is a question from Goggs. Well, that's the same approach that our government generally takes. Yeah. They put their <laughs> Sounds heads familiar. Stand, you know, maybe it'll go away. Yeah. Or maybe we can explain it. <laughs> oh. Well, this leads to another question from Goggs, uh, Colonel. Do you have any views over the supposed secrecy group that may exist to control UFO information? And uh, you will be aware uh, of Lord Hill Norton believes such a group uh, must exist. Even as chief of the UK defense staff, he felt he was being stonewalled when trying to investigate UFO matters. Do you think such a group exists? I do. And I did, by the way, have correspondence back and forth with Lord Hill Norton before he passed away. And I wish I'd had an opportunity to meet him because I share a lot of his views. Hmm. Oh, that's that's one for the uh, for the the conspiracy side of this. I've I've always felt that there's there has to be some sort of group, well, conspiracy uh, is, is not is not real simple. And, and, you know, yeah, I'm, it's it's true. Come to realize it's there's probably I would say maybe a half a dozen to a dozen agencies that collect information and pass it somewhere. I'd be willing to bet this is just a guess that there's an agency that's a civilian contract agency made up with people from former or current government people, high-level military perhaps, some scientists, uh, that's under contract through a company such as, now I don't mean this is a company such as SCAIC or Lockheed or somebody like that as a contract that handles whatever is necessary to be handled as far as containing it. That's my personal opinion. That makes sense. Uh, you know, then you talk that way. They can keep it. They can keep it. Uh, keep it out of anybody crying and getting into it for freedom of information or anything else. Right. I've always felt that there's a lot in the private sector just being being held there because of its inaccessibility. But you talk mm-hmm. with someone like uh, retired Colonel John Alexander, who claims he and, and he's a, a Colonel, by the way. Not, pardon me. And he's a, John's a good personal friend of mine. John and yeah. I. John wrote a very good book. John Alexander and I go way back. I've known John for probably 25 years. Uh, he was the first person who I thought was uh, debriefed me in, informally. Actually, he was poking around on his own trying to get information when he was running the Long Lethal Weapons Program. So, yeah, I'm very familiar with John Alexander. In fact, I had lunch with him last week. Well, he's been on the Paracast, and, of course, he's also had debates with people like Stanton Friedman over whether the government has guilty knowledge about the UFO phenomenon. What do you think? Uh, there's some knowledge somewhere, to put it that way. So you think there are secrets to be had there, or, or are they just as mystified there as the rest of us? There are secrets to be had, but I don't think you'll find them, and you will not get access to them until it's well, determined by whoever that it's time. Well, Colonel, what do, you, what do you make of John Alexander never mentioning the uh, the NSA in the entire book? Uh, wouldn't you think that would be one of the first places you'd uh, try to poke around? That would be one of the first places you'd poke around. I can tell you that, you know, the NSA is, a, how shall I say, a, a very interesting organization, and then we'll leave it at that. They have a lot of compartmentalized program. Yeah, well, it, because you're, you're, you know, obviously you've, you've been involved in, in what is a, an historic event in terms of this phenomenon and reporting on this phenomenon. How have your views changed? Um, this comes from Ezekiel. Uh, what do you think of the anonymous Cooper and his deathbed confession uh, uh, that was uh, – at this citizens hearing on disclosure recently in Washington D.C., Richard Dolan had uh, this unnamed person on there who uh, had some fantastic claims. Are you aware of those claims? And what do you think of I've, people like that? And Philip Corso, for instance. Well, I I really don't know them that well. Keep in mind, I don't belong to any UFO organization. I don't subscribe to any of their magazines or anything. I do get an awful lot of stuff sent to me unsolicited, or people, you know, call me or send me an email, and whatnot, and 
legitimate people, I'll talk with and respond to them. Uh, the, the fringe element, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. I just kind of blow it off. I put this on the shelf. I don't worry about it every day. There's no doubt in my mind that we are not alone. There is some type of intelligent whatever that can play with us, appear, disappear at will, do all kinds of phenomenal things, influence people, do strange things that we don't understand. And it's just beyond our understanding, I guess is the best way to put it. So you would expect then that UFOs are probably caused by visitors from other planets? Uh, either that or another dimension, possibly. There's been a lot of talk about that lately and certainly some possibilities there. As a former military person, do you find that your friends look at you and say, are you sure you haven't gone off the deep end? Well, I get a little bit of that, but most of the people know me know, and they know that I don't dwell on it. I'm responding to you, but I didn't search you. I'd keep in mind. I'm not out on a pedestal every day. I'm mm -hmm. going to do a program with Leslie here in, in June in North Carolina, which promises to be very interesting and provide a lot of information to people that are concerned. But you were asked, which is the important thing. We'll get back to more of this in a moment. Colonel Charles Halt joining us with Leslie Kane. Now, coming next week on the Paracast, we'll be featuring Kathleen Martin and Denise Stoner to talk about a new book called Human Alien Contact Reports, New Case Studies and Evidence Support Alien Abduction. More to come with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, we fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. If you love pineapple as much as I do, I've got some great news for you. You're going to love this offer from Freeze Dry Guy. For the month of May, Freeze Dry Guy is offering the finest quality freeze dried pineapple, a case of six number 10 cans yielding 114 servings at a special introductory price. First quality freeze dried pineapple grown and packed with nothing added. This healthy treat works wonders with salad, is great for snacking, hiking, hunting, camping, and for adding to your food storage program. And please note that Freeze Dry Guy's foods will store on your shelf for decades. Order now and get free shipping to your front door within the lower 48 states. This special introductory price is good until May 31st. For more information and a free complete product list, go to freezedryguy.com or phone 866-404-3663. freezedryguy.com, 866-404-3663. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So we've been asking your questions of Charles Halt. We have Leslie Kane on the show. We're talking about the Rendlesham UFO case. We'll get back to other questions in a moment, Colonel Halt. But... We verify you feel UFOs are either from other worlds or other dimensions, things like that. What about people who claim that the government not only has guilty knowledge, but they may have communicated with these beings? Do you have any feeling about that? No. At one time I had, you know, I kind of thought that there may have been something to run with Roswell, but I really don't know enough to comment on it intelligently. 
What do you think of Roswell? Anything at all? Any comments? I would say there's certainly a good possibility that something phenomenal did happen there and at Kecksburg and several other places. Okay. Okay, we understand that. Now, have you ever, other than this, have you ever seen anything else unusual, strange, or anything like that? And you mean another UFO, if you will? No. Yeah, okay. I've not. Now, I know there's some people that every time, you know, the sky gets dark, they see something, but I'm not one of those people. I don't go around looking up all the time, but I, I do scan the sky occasionally, but I mean, I'm not hunting for UFOs. Can I ask a question? I'm, you know, back to the issue of whether there might be this uh, secret kind of research program going on in this contracted corporation or whatever. I mean, uh, I'm curious whether you have, um, Colonel Halt, whether you've ever actively kind of pursued through contacts that you might have in the military, whether you've ever really tried to find out, you know, or just through your own efforts to try to learn more about that, or have you just sort of stood back and not really made many inquiries about it? No, I have not made any inquiries. Right. Not because I'm sure you believe that if you did, you wouldn't get anywhere anyway, right? I won't get anywhere. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. I have friends that have worked at NSA and I don't even know what they did, except they went into the building in the morning and came out in the evening. Right. And I know yeah, better to even ask them. We, when I was in the DODIG, we did an organizational inspection of NSA. And it was one of those things where every time you open a door, there's another door. And you don't get through a lot of the doors. Well, can you explain then why Colonel Alexander would believe that because he asked a bunch of people and didn't find out, that therefore there is no program? He obviously doesn't agree with you that he would never be able to find out. Well, and I've told him, and he, we can laugh about it now, but I told him publicly in a forum, I said, John, you're either very naive or part of the problem. And he didn't like it. But that's the nature of it. And those are my feelings. Yeah. With all the contacts he had, I'm sure he should have, he should have stumbled into something. But maybe he didn't. We have questions here from somebody. Let me give you his his screen name or his member name in our forums and i won't comment about what that means it is yeti turds for sale oh well that doesn't tell me anything yeah at least he's creative gene that's uh that's pretty creative okay three questions for charles halt colonel halt how much of the rendlesham story is still not publicly known due to security oaths national defense interests and the like Everything that I've known is, is, is out there now. Now, I may change my mind or opinion on something, but, you know, all the facts that I know are out there. I have not held anything back. I don't. You know, several years ago, I told a couple of people I made a tape. And what I did is I sat down and put all my recollections on a tape, made a couple copies, sort of an insurance policy, and just helped refresh my memory if I ever needed to. And somehow that got construed as I had a second tape from the night I was out there, and it was very, very interesting. Well, no such thing. I had one tape, one tape recorder, and it only had a short battery life. That is it. Now, there is no, there is, as far as I know. Now, somebody else could come forward and say, I, you know, I was in the weapon storage area that night, or I was here, I was there. Several people have claimed to have done things or been places that's uh, quite questionable. There's a lot of wannabes, as I call them. Okay, about wannabes, what do you think are some of the misconceptions that are getting too much attention, well, the, other the original, than the skeptical viewpoint? The original story that was released by Larry Warren to, to Larry Fawcett and his co-worker was that the wing commander was out there, Gordon Williams. I know he wasn't. I, know, I knew his whereabouts because we kept track on the radio. He also claimed that little green men came out and communicated with him. He claimed there was a fog surrounding this craft. There was no craft tonight I was out there, because that's the only night he could have possibly even been in the background somewhere. And that we got parts from the avionics shop and repaired this craft. Now, how ludicrous can things be? And you wonder how we figure out what happened last month or last year. Well, I'm convinced that Larry was brought in, and he was a dupe, and they they filled him full of stuff. And I've told him this about a hundred times. Every time I bumped into him anywhere, I said, "Larry, you know, you're just a walking which one, a source of disinformation." And he's even admitted to me, "Well, maybe," but he's enjoyed it. And always made a career out of it. Wow. Yeah, that that leads to a, a, another question on the forum. Uh, 
One way to cover up such an event as Reynolds Shim Forest is to plant a disinformation agent with claims so wild, very few people would believe them. So do you think that Jim Penniston uh, is involved in that sort of disinformation with these now these these revelations of digital uh, codes that uh, he was downloaded with? And do you think that there's there is disinformation going on from the get go on this? Do you think this could have been an well, elaborate is, disinformation? There is, but I'm not sure Jim is doing it intentionally. Yeah. OK. Do, are you aware of the of the, the problems that they've had getting access to their medical records uh, because of uh, health issues that they want? I, I, I watched that issue, that 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 segment on that program in Washington. And I don't agree with a lot of that. I wrote them a very nice letter explaining to the, to the VA, explaining everything that happened to them and that there could possibly be some ramifications from radiation or something and, and gave them a real nice letter. And then they turned around and threatened to sue me. Really? Uh, oh, I wasn't aware yeah. of that. I mean, what what would the motivation be uh, to say that for to someone that's trying to help? Well, you have to understand them, the mindset. Uh, when you become obsessed with something, you know, you, uh, it becomes troublesome for you is the best way to put it. So the implication being here that some people involved in this case have become obsessed? Oh, that's not the word. <laughs> that's an understatement. Okay. I think we sort of figure out what you're referring to here. You know, there's an interesting question here from Boomerang, and that is, for Colonel Halt, do you lend any credence to theories that events at Rendlesham may have been the result of testing or application of psychotronic weaponry? No, I don't. Uh, I had this conversation with Jacques Boulay some time ago. Okay. He and I have gone back and forth on this. Uh, no. Uh, there were too many people dispersed. There were too large of an area, three different radio nets involved. It just it, it, it was just been too difficult to do at that time. I'm not even sure we could do it today. If you had a small group of people in close proximity, maybe. No, I don't think. My personal opinion now, after reviewing everything I've learned through the years from the people who have come forward after the fact, is that I'm convinced that that area in the Rendlesham Forest there is a hot spot, so to speak, or a portal or something. There's some attractant there besides what we were doing there. It, what's going on or what's going on is still going on. I still get reports from British friends that, were, that I knew when I was stationed there that there's strange happenings out there in the forest. Well, this is one of the things, of course, that we've talked about in the Paracast, and Chris is intimately familiar with some of this because of the work he's done in the Mysterious Valley. And that is there are certain areas around the world, you can call portal areas or whatever. And there was a TV show based on that premise, a UK TV show called Primeval, where they have these dimensional windows and people or creatures sometimes would jump back and forth between them. So when we look at other events in Rendlesham, any more UFOs aside from this particular event and before we ask for your answer, we do have to do a break momentarily. We're talking to Colonel Charles Halt, one of the key figures in the Rendlesham UFO case. We have Leslie Kane, who is serving double duty, both as guest and also as a panelist. Leslie, I really appreciate the questions and the feedback here. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and thwarting phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know.
Have you ever felt like the United States government knows way too much about your financial affairs? I continue to hear stories about property seizures, frozen bank accounts, confiscation of stocks and bonds. It makes me wonder if the U.S. citizen will ever again have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. It's time to get real. It's time to prepare. Economic collapse, social unrest, natural disasters, government takeover, UN takeover. Are you ready? 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 Get ready at the Social Prepper Trade Show in Dalton, Georgia, June 6th, 7th, and 8th. Three massive days to learn self-reliance and emergency preparedness. Exhibitors ranging from survival, solar, power, food, protection, guns, ammo, disaster preparation products, hunting, and much more. Seminars by Dr. Wallach, Robert Henry, Raymond Blake Hogshead, Trish Deer, Sandy Hall, Rick Austin, Survivor Jane, and more of our nation's experts on survival and preparedness. Don't miss the Social Prepper Trade Show, June 6th through 8th, Dalton, Georgia. For discount tickets, prize raffle, and Info, go to socialprepper.com. Enter code GCN for 50% online ticket discount purchase. The Social Prepper Trade Show, presented in part by GCN. Gardeners, here comes another growing season, but don't use last year's soil. Maximize yields in your survival garden with EM1 from Terraganics. EM1 is an organic soil conditioner, fertilizer amendment, and compost accelerant that provides a broad spectrum of beneficial microorganisms, enzymes, trace minerals, vitamins, and various organic acids. EM1 helps regulate the soil's pH level and its soil microbes, improving moisture retention and drought tolerance. Remember last year's dry conditions? EM1 from Terraganics is safe, chemical-free, and certified for use on all organic farms. It improves plant quality, size, color, flavor, and gives up to 20% more nutrient value in fruits and vegetables and greatly increases shelf life. And EM1 is so simple to use, just mix with water and apply. This year, prepare your crisis garden for maximum yields with EM1 from Terraganix.com. Order now at T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Terraganix, life's getting better. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Colonel Charles Halt, Leslie Kane joining us in the Paracast this week with Gene and Chris. So, Colonel Halt. Did you have a response at all to my silly question? I've been told that there have been strange, they call them orbs, I guess, glowing objects and several other unexplained phenomena that take place in that area. And people, you know, claim to have seen objects, but I can't say they've seen that I know of any mechanically structured objects. Well, you mentioned Jacques Vallée, and of course his magnus opus, I think, his passport to Magonia where he talks about uh, the tradition of fairies and gnomes and, and elementals that go back uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. The Rendlesham Forest is no different. Do you think that those types of descriptions back in medieval times might be what we are now calling UFOs or orbs or, or more of a high-tech sort of view of these things? Do you think there may be a connection there? Well, I'll tell you something interesting. Just up the road from Rendlesham Forest is Butley Village. Butley Village is supposed to be the home of British witchcraft. Could that tie in? I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of other things in the area that could certainly attract attention. Uh, Orford Island, by the way, that's where the lighthouse is, is where the British did their experimental work on nuclear weapons tr- triggers and several other highly classified projects. Sizeville Nuclear Power Plant is just up the coast a couple of miles. Just down the coast is RAF Bodzi. RAF Bodzi is where the big Experimental radar was installed during World War II to pick up the German bombers when they came over the channel. 
So there are lots of things in that area. Very quick question here, which relates to what we've talked about so far, Colonel Halt. Can you tell us your view of this, of all these things before Rendlesham encounter and after? How did this change your viewpoint about what's going on here and about the universe? Well, to be honest with you, I never gave you a a second thought until this incident occurred. In fact, whenever I was summoned to go out into the forest, I was firmly convinced there was a logical explanation. And as things unfolded, you know, more events, the the object we saw, the exploding object, the objects in the sky moving at high speed and sharp angular turns, the object that came from the south overhead and sent down a beam, you know, as more of this was evolving, I was thinking, oh, nobody's ever going to believe this. How am I ever going to explain this? And I was in too deep to say nothing happened because I've been talking to the command post the whole time, and the cops all knew it. Uh, it really didn't change a whole lot. Like I said earlier, I put it on the shelf. There's something there. I know that. Can yeah. I change it? No, I can't. You know, why should I worry about it? I'm still going to go to work tomorrow. I'm still going to have to pay my electric bill. I'm still going to, you know, have to put gas in the car. Now, after you left the Air Force, what kind of work did you go into? I ran a community association, a small, equivalent a small city of 7,000 people self-contained did that for i've recently retired totally but the question here with regard to the air force did you retire when you did because of any fact or just because you reached the age where you get your pension i had gotten to the point where i was reaching you know the, the maximum time i could stay in and i didn't want to move out of the area and so i had 28 and a half years in and i just wanted to stay in northern virginia so i put my retirement papers in yeah, I have a question here from Ufology, who's one of our most active posters and uh, forum participants at forum.theparacast.com. And this is news to me. I hadn't heard about this. Uh, perhaps you could shed a little light. What is your response to the Kevin Conde confession? Um, I guess he's uh, con- contacted uh, researcher James Easton in 2001 and related that he had played a practical joke on security specialists assigned as a gate guard at Eastgate at RAF Woodbridge. The practical joke occurred during the same general time period as the Rendlesham Forest incident, and the circumstances of the practical joke were remarkably similar in description. I guess he was, must have been on some sort of show or something. Uh, the description seemed to mirror some of the descriptions of the UFO reported by Penniston and uh and Burroughs. Uh, are you familiar with this person, this Kevin Conde? I, I know Kevin Conde. Well, I mean, I knew him back at Bentwaters. And he was a bit of a jokester. And I do think he probably did take a police car to the gate or something. I can tell you, if he, the police cars in those days were K cars. You may not be familiar with the old K cars made by Chrysler. They were a piece of junk, but Mr. McNamara decided he would save a lot of money by buying a whole lot of them. And they didn't hold up and they weren't worth anything. But anyhow, they were just a rear wheel drive, small family sedan. Uh, We put lights on and put the radios in them and they didn't work worth a darn. But anyhow, Condi may have taken one out to the gate. He couldn't have taken it off the base without permission. You cannot do that, number one. If he had taken it out into the forest, he wouldn't have brought it back unless he had a tow truck. But you'd have to have a high center of gravity and four wheel drive to go out where that incident occurred. Does that answer your question? I think so. I, I, you know, this is the first again that I've heard of this, and it doesn't sound like something that you could use as a explanation for one of the most compelling, I think, uh, and well documented cases that we have. Uh, it, for someone to pull something like that off is, to me, akin to uh, college students pulling off the Socorro incident, as has been alleged by by some revisionist uh, researchers. You mentioned that you don't really have a connection to this particular field, that you wouldn't have come out and really been publicly uh, vocal about any of this unless you had experienced what you did experience back in 1980. What would you tell other military officers in a command situation such as you were? Uh, Would you give them any advice on based on how you had to deal with this event? What would you tell them uh, that they should be aware of or how to respond to certain things? Uh, what would be your uh, your your list of, of suggestions for someone in, in a similar position? Probably the first thing I would tell them is I wouldn't say much or if anything. I would, you know, devour all, devour all knowledge of whatever. Because quite frankly, as I mentioned earlier, once you touch it, man, you're stuck with it. It never goes away. 
uh, it just it's one of those things, and it becomes a bit of a how should I say a bit of a pain. Gosh, you're, uh, and, you know, and I've even an been being part of the part of the cover up that I'm hiding something. I'm not hiding anything. Yeah, you're as much of a victim in this situation as everyone else that had to deal with it out there. I'm, you know, and it puts you in even a worse position because you're, you're, you're in command. And well, I signed the memo. I made the tape. Exactly. I took the tape along because I carried the tape just about everywhere I went, so I have some evidence. I took the disaster preparedness guy along with Guy Eggerkiner on APN 27, so I could show that there was no radiation out there, and he also had a camera. So the idea was to go out there and put this single thing to rest. Well, that didn't work very well. Yeah. So the short answer is deny everything. <laughs> don't don't engage. <laughs> Unless you're prepared to spend the rest of your life answering questions and dealing with critics and skeptics and Lord knows what all. Do you have any regrets now, Colonel Halt, over being public about this? Would you have preferred to maybe just keep it a secret and get on with your life? I would have preferred that. But the the fact is, once it came out and there was so much disinformation, I felt an obligation to set the record straight. So this is what you continue to do, and this is the reason why you get up in the morning sometimes and you come on a radio show like this or you attend a special event, a UFO-related event like the one in North Carolina in June? I do very, very few events. You know, you didn't see me in Washington. Well, we've gone into that before you came on and why I can understand why a lot of people didn't want to come to that Washington event, but that's another story. We have Colonel Charles Halt joining us with Leslie Kane and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com If you're going to have a bunker, why not have an ultimate bunker? In case of pandemic outbreak, civil unrest, biological or nuclear fallout, or EMP attacks, stay safe in your own ultimate bunker. Built for lasting security for any need or budget. Manufactured in Salt Lake City, Utah, each ultimate bunker includes free food storage and all the comforts of home. Learn more at ultimatebunker.com. That's ultimatebunker.com. Or call 801-661-3900. Ultimate Bunker. You can't do better than the ultimate. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. If you owe the IRS back taxes, listen carefully. Sweeping changes to IRS policies will help more people than ever eliminate their tax debts once and for all. And now I can help you reduce or eliminate your tax debts and end your tax nightmare. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. I've helped thousands of people reduce and eliminate tax debts they couldn't pay. And after more than 30 years of experience dealing with the IRS, I can tell you there's no such thing as a hopeless tax case. And with the IRS's new policies, it's easier than ever to put your tax debt behind you once and for all. Call now at 800-346-6829 to learn how I can help you. You know your IRS debt will not go away by itself, but you don't have to live in fear anymore. Call 800-346-6829. Learn how I can help you eliminate wage and bank levies, release tax liens, and negotiate a settlement with the IRS that will put your tax nightmare behind you forever. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to taxhelponline.com 
That's TaxHelpOnline.com. This message dares all fish oil consumers. Yes, many people now take fish oil supplements, but the makers of K48 Plus want you to know it's not what you consume, but how it is absorbed that counts. So we dare you to compare fish oil with K48 Plus. K48 Plus, an omega-3 powerhouse, is made with the highest grade and most potent dose of krill oil available and is 48 times more easily absorbed than common fish oil. K48 Plus is both a remarkable anti-inflammatory as well as a powerful antioxidant. If you suffer from ailments such as diabetes, COPD, autism, arthritis, depression, migraines, lupus, Alzheimer's, glaucoma, joint pain, high cholesterol, memory loss, or Crohn's disease, you need to see the K48 Plus video at livepremium.net. That's L-I-V-E premium.net. Or please call 208-521-3601. That's 208-521-3601. And ask about K48 Plus. Restore hope. Optimize health with K48 Plus. Hello, this is Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. With Gene and Chris, with Leslie Kane and Charles Holt, talking about UFOs, Rendlesham, all sorts of things, let's go back very briefly, Colonel Holt, to the citizen hearing on disclosure. You weren't there. And I was invited. I was encouraged by several of the participants and promised all sorts of things. And I said I just didn't want to be involved. There were too many people there that, uh, and too many things that I was sure were going to happen that I didn't want to be associated with. Well, I think you were shown to be quite correct. And that explains why Leslie and other people didn't come on the event either. But what do you think here, as someone, I guess she'll call you an outsider. You've had the experience, but you're not a participant in the UFO field. What do events like that do in terms of trying to get to answers? Just muddy the waters? Well, I'm convinced the one in Washington muddied the waters. There was so much, how shall I say? uh, Well, well, you can't use the words you want to, but you can use some other words. I can use some other words, yes. You can abbreviate those words, like BS. It It played right into the hands of those that like to make everybody that has anything to do or reports a UFO look like a kook. That's I mean, I was shocked. I know Paul Hillier, the uh, former Ministry of Defense from Canada. In his presentation, he started talking about the tall whites and the small grays and eight or ten other people. Now, that's certainly possible, but, I mean, he didn't do anything to substantiate that. And he even, I thought, mentioned my name. I wasn't sure and said I had contact with him. I'm not sure whether he met me or somebody else. He's confused. I'm, I don't know. Okay, so we know that you haven't had contact. Have you had any unusual experiences after Rendlesham, though? None that relate to something like that. Well, unusual experiences in general. No, not really. Nothing that I can attribute to, you know, some other uh, force or person or being or intelligence. Have you ever been approached and told, uh, you know, you shouldn't uh, say certain things in public? Uh, Have you had any sort of of admonishments from the government or from uh, the military or anything? Or they've just pretty much let you... um, you know, respond. No, let, me, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Before I retired, I ran the inspection director for the DODIG. That was back in 1989 through 90, late 91. I was approached by Unsolved Mysteries to do the program, which I did end up doing. And I was a little nervous. I was on active duty, so I went in and talked to the IG and said, "I've been approached to do this program, and here's what it's about." And I was told, "Sit down and tell me about it." So I described. Spent about 45 minutes to describe what happened. And the answer was, "Go do it." And I did it. The key being here that nobody from the military ever said, Colonel Halt, don't make public statements, don't participate in these TV shows, that kind of thing. Nope, never. As long as you did your job. As long as I did my job. No, I did have some people tell me, man, I wouldn't do that if I were you. But that was, you know, friendly advice, so to speak. And no feedback after the show? Did they say, hey, you look real good there? Uh, You really got TV appeal? Nothing like that? (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I did get some feedback, but it was rather positive, I guess. See, I, I wasn't on Unsolved Mysteries. They hired an actor to do it. All I did was provide technical advice and help them do the script and put it together. So we didn't see you? You didn't see me. 
I've okay. been on some other programs, but not on Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah, it was all done with recreations, uh, that, that portion of it. In fact, I went to the Kennedy Center here a couple years ago to a performance of Sheer Madness with my play. And the act, one of the lead actors was the guy that played me in Unsolved Mysteries. And we had a big laugh after the program. Do you look anything <laughs> like you? Uh, a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm he sure you did a good you're... job. I was impressed. They actually did a, did do a good job with that episode. I, I actually that's one of the few that I remember fairly well um, over the many episodes that that show uh, ran for years. Uh, well, that I was wish, one I, of the I wish better... I had signed an agreement and gotten residuals. I'd be rich. <laughs> they reran the thing about 150, 200 times. Yeah, they did. They well, did. they they never give residuals. No, to oh, people. I, I didn't ask segments. for them. They just paid my expenses. All right. We know how that works out. Chris, are there any questions left, or have we covered pretty much everything? We pretty much covered uh, the full gamut. Uh, a lot of the questions have been answered by Colonel Halt already, so I'm not going to have him restate uh, answers to questions that have already been uh, been addressed. Uh, I'm just uh, just very gratified that you're willing to come out and speak uh, with Gene and myself and, and, um, and go down to North Carolina and, and present – uh, your experience uh, in the objective way and, and very, um, you know, with great brevity, I might might add. I, I really do appreciate that you have, have done this. And it would really be nice if we could get more uh, military uh, personnel uh, to come forward who have experiences uh, akin to this. W- are you familiar? I, I'm sure you are with Robert Hastings' work. What? How do you see I ben know Robert Rodgers? Hastings. Robert and I are good friends. Yeah, and I, I would imagine. I, I know that he has um, has talked to you extensively. What are your general feelings about these objects showing up around facilities where uh, fissionable material is, is there, where, whether it be missiles, uh, ordnance, uh, nuclear power plants, that sort of thing? Do you, do you have any sort of uh, gut feeling on that, or have you really given it much thought? Do you think that there is some sort of correlation between Bent Waters and, let's say, the Malmstrom and Offutt Air Force Base events uh, in the 60s and 70s? I don't think the correlation is as strong as I once thought it was because the activity has continued. Maybe not at the same, how should I say, the same level, but it still has continued. But there's certainly an, an obvious interest in certain military weapons. No. Well, if they were so far advanced of us, I, I wouldn't think that they'd be that concerned. If they possibly had some vested interest in the ecosystem here, obviously keeping tabs on these uh, potentially catastrophic uh, <laughs> materials uh, would make sense. So I've always felt that this, uh, this interest in, in showing up around 47 as they did uh, after we had gone nuclear, um, I would think that, uh, that there may be that, – that bolsters, I think, uh, theories of, by people like Jacques Vallée and John Keel that maybe we're dealing with something as terrestrial as we are and by – by uh, demonstrating our ability to potentially destroy all, most of the life forms on this planet with radiation, that would make sense that they'd show up and monitor our progress in that regard. Uh, so I've always felt that that bolstered that particular argument. Uh, where, where do you come down on that? I tend to agree with that. I think we're being monitored. And we're occasionally getting the message, hopefully. So do you think that ET, if they're monitoring us, they have a prime directive not to interfere or that they can interfere to some degree, especially if we're going to be screwing ourselves with nuclear weapons. Yeah, I think they're very carefully interfering and selectively. So do you, do you think it's some sort of conditioning process, uh, as uh, Jacques Vallée has uh, suggested, that it's, it's kind of a slow sort of incremental uh, conditioning process, or do you think there are key events like Rendlesham that may somehow jumpstart uh, awareness or um, put a, you know, light a fire under under the military or the government? Uh, I, I, I don't think Rendlesham was meant to be a key event. I think it's just the way it evolved. No. So Keep you in mind, see... if the memo hadn't gone out and the tape hadn't been released, you wouldn't know anything about it. Yeah. That's, there that's are a lot of events. I'm firmly convinced. I've talked to a significant number of military people that have seen things that, that definitely are not, you know, they're out of the ordinary. Let's just say that. But they, uh, I'm not going to do anything. Look what happened to you. Yeah, that's that was one of my questions: is whether you're going public has uh, persuaded and. Uh, yeah. Sort of motivated other other military personnel to contact you and say, "Well, check this out." 
Well, I think the fact that I was pub- went public is what brought the air traffic controllers out and several other people who have come on board and, and made statements that were present at the time but didn't want to say anything. So so you think that that that, that you've had a positive effect in that in that regard uh even though you've had some personal um qualms about ever coming forward in the first place obviously and you would have rather this situation had not occurred to begin with. Uh, what do you advise uh, people uh, like that who are thinking about coming out and maybe uh, corroborating some sort of uh, other testimony or getting involved personally in these in these matters? I'll tell you what, before we have the answer, we've got to do this break. With your permission, Colonel, okay. we have Colonel Charles Halt. We have Leslie Kane with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first-class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one-click web apps such as WordPress, 24-7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to DreamHost.com slash radio, DreamHost.com slash radio. Whether Whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. The 9th Annual Health Freedom Expo returns June 7th through June 9th at the Schaumburg Convention Center in Schaumburg, Illinois, featuring over 75 world-renowned doctors, activists, and experts. Meet Dr. Joel Wallach, author of Dead Doctors Don't Lie, actress and activist Daryl Hannah, famed Dr. Patch Adams, woman's health expert Dr. Joan Borisenko, GMO activist Jeffrey Smith, and renowned natural health doctor Dr. Joseph Mercola. Sample delicious healthy foods, watch award-winning documentaries, attend exciting panel discussions, discover the latest natural health products and be sure to check out the expo hall filled with 200 exhibitors don't forget about the new interactive pavilions and receive free screenings it's all here under one roof for only 20 dollars a day or 45 dollars for the entire three-day weekend it costs less than a doctor's visit but hurry tickets are going fast for tickets and info visit healthfreedomexpo.com or call 888-658-3972 the health freedom expo your one source for total natural health solutions Being prepared against possible food shortages and economic collapse is not complicated. Just remember two words, disaster, stuff. Add.com after those two words and you've got just one site for all your preparedness needs. Disasterstuff.com prepares your family against food shortages with Linden Farms freeze-dried foods in buckets or gourmet reserves, freeze-dried food in number 10 cans, both with free shipping. Purify and rid your water of contaminants with a big Berkey or other Berkey system and get free shipping plus a water level spigot or fluoride filter at cost and protect your radios and other electric from EMPs with our EMP Faraday bags starting at just $5.90. When the food shortages and economic instability happens, be ready with all your stuff from DisasterStuff.com. Just remember two words, DisasterStuff.com. Freedom through self-reliance and personal responsibility. Have you ever consumed protein powder supplements? I have, and all of them don't taste that good. Have artificial flavors, sweeteners, or unhealthy sugars. About a year ago, I was introduced to a new protein powder that changed my experience. This protein powder made me feel noticeably better, and it tasted more delicious than any drink I've ever had. Here's the experience of one satisfied user named Rich. The term best of all worlds has been belabored to death. And yet I've just discovered a whey protein powder that truly deserves to be called best of all worlds. Best taste, by far. Best results, by far. You almost feel like you're cheating that something that tastes that good could be so good for you. Thank you, Stephen, and Cocoon Nutrition. One World Way truly is the best of all worlds. The only way for me. Yours truly, Rich from Georgia. Real user, 
real happy. Call 888-988-3325 or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's OneWorld, W-H-E-Y.com. This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. We have Leslie Kane, we have Charles Holt, we have Gene, we have Chris. You're in the Paracast with our final segment. We've answered loads of your questions from our guests, from Charles Holt and from Leslie Kane. And now we're going to look at, shall we say, the end game. But first, Chris, before we did our break, asked a lengthy question of Colonel Holt. I guess advice to people in the military about coming forth with UFO-related information? Well, the first thing I would say is that if you're in line for promotion or something, it's probably not a wise thing to do. It's not career-enhancing. And you have to have a, how should I say, good credibility and be doing, you know, what you do and doing it well, or you're going to have a lot of problems. It could be an excuse to to do some damage to you. It's not looked upon favorably. If I hadn't been in the point of my career where I was, I probably wouldn't have done it. Are you aware of situations where careers have been hurt because of this? Uh, Yes, especially enlisted people. Look what happened to Jim Penniston. He was totally derailed. Jim Penniston was on a fast track to probably be a chief master sergeant. Jim Penniston was one of the few NCOs that I had the base commander endorse his efficiency report. I probably did that a handful of times over four years, and he was one of the few people. He was going places. And after this incident, he just he got all kinds of issues and trouble. And he claims that, you know, he was followed, he was this, he was that. I don't know about that. He may have become paranoid. I, I can't answer that. But I know he had a lot of problems, and it derailed his career. It certainly didn't help Burroughs either. And don't you think that's the big problem, that maybe we're missing out on information about lots of cases from members of the military, from airline pilots, etc., because they fear if they come forth, their career is history? Sure. It was, I, it was deferred to me to write the memo. Why didn't the base commander write the memo, or why didn't the wing commander write the memo? Why do they all turn to me? Yeah, Think good about question. <laughs> Kind of a rhetorical question. I was shocked. But, uh, they said, right, you know, get with Don Morning and, you know, do what he wants. And he said, they, I said, he wants a memo. So and I showed everybody the memo. They knew. It was no surprise. They let it go. Now, 30 or 40 years later, I said, we'd never let that go out. Well, they knew about it. It was no surprise. It was typed right there in the office. So how do we encourage people to come forth with these UFO cases? This might contain the smoking guns. How do we know? I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. I don't think you're going to get an answer uh, until the attitude changes. And part of the problem is there's so much disinformation, and this has been played by agencies and, you know, made a, a bit of a, what do you want to call it, a ridicule type thing. You say disinformation. I'm assuming then feeding false information into the UFO cesspool. Any specific examples that come to mind? Well, I gave you a good one of that, Colonel Wilson, that supposedly sure. came forward. He even sent emails. He, he got on coast to coast and made all kinds of statements. And he obviously knew an awful lot about Bentwaters at the time and how it operated and the names and all sorts of things. So you think he was so, encouraged by the military to do that? Th- there is no such person. I can tell you there's uh, not. Do, do you think he was sent by some kind of government agency, or do you think he was operating independently and just trying to have a good time? I couldn't have been operating independently, I don't think, unless he'd been stationed there at the time and knew everybody and knew what had happened, knew the whole story. So he knew because he much. knew too much, you mean? He knew too much. He knew too much. No, it had to be a planted story. Do you have any opinions as to where you think that might, you know, where he might have been, his originated, where he might have originated from and who sent him to do this? No, we, we try no hard. I, I have a friend that can chase anybody down look for him and we went through the military records and there was nobody of that name, that age, you know, that had that experience and so forth. Nobody. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned somebody else that was there that got him from the BOQ and brought him out to set up the equipment, the captain, and there was no such person at Bent Waters. Do you have contact information for this guy? No, we couldn't find him. He disappeared. I see. I tried to find him. Hastings tried to find him. I had several other people that really knew how to search people down, try and find him. No, no luck. Nothing yeah. in military records. Yeah, that, that was that, bogus. That, that, but that it chases the circles for a month or two. That's what makes it so difficult. It sure does. Now, you're going to be appearing with Leslie and a number of other guests at this UFO event, this symposium, come late June. What are you going to present there? Yeah. Pardon? 
What do you plan on presenting at the 2013 Symposium on Official and Scientific Investigations of UAP UFOs? Basically, what I'm going to do is my intention now is to explain what happened to me and go into great detail as to some of my thoughts and add a little more background information and substantiate the story a little more thoroughly. So you'll take questions from people who attend and all that kind of thing. You're going to present Certainly. pictures, slides, and stuff like that? I have, a few, I have a few slides, and I don't have a picture of a UFO, but I can certainly show some things, and I can certainly show where we were in the, you know, in the forest, where the lighthouse was, where the farmer's house was, and in detail what happened. And you can play part of the tape, your original tape, right? Well, I'm going to try to. <laughs> My tape recorder's died again. Well, we can play a digital tape. version of it. We can play a digital version of it. At least people could hear it. Yeah, we can do that. That's the best way. If you need any assistance with a digital creation, you know, let me or Chris know, because okay. we do that kind of thing. That's what we don't get the big bucks for. I understand. <laughs> well, pack up your gear and come down the end of June to the, to the program. Leslie, tell us more about it once again for those tuning in late. Well, it's a, it's an effort uh, to really bring together the most credible military and government people and scientists on this issue, and it's a it's a great lineup of people. And people can go to the website, which is C U F O R N C. It stands for Center for UFO Research, North Carolina. Or if you go to my Facebook page, I have links there, and I guess you're going to put one up at the Paracast page as well. Yes, we will. And I just I just recommend that people go and check it out. It's a really, really unusual opportunity to to see the really serious official people. And as I mentioned earlier, I think the fact that representatives from the Chilean agency and the French agency are both coming is quite historic because they've never spoken at a conference before. And these are actual government officials who have spent a long time investigating the phenomenon on behalf of their own governments. And they're going to talk about how their op agencies operate and what they've actually learned about the phenomenon from the work they do. So that's a really special component of the whole thing. And of that, course, having Charles Holt there is very, very special as well, along with these government officials from other countries. And we've got many other great speakers. This one thing about talking to a person who's been in the military and has a distinguished record. When you listen to them, there's an air of truth there. I certainly share. hear that from Charles Hall. I mean, the, just the, the very efficiency, the very quick right. efficiency of his responses. No nonsense. He knows exactly what he's talking about. He knows the case inside out. He's, in, he's just, you know, absolutely just amazing to listen to as far as I'm concerned. As and very, hear. very credible, as, you, as we just heard. Now, we should mention this is Saturday and Sunday, June 29th and 30th, 2013. We mentioned 2013 in case you're listening to the show two years from now when it's too late to go, <laughs> right. unless you go back through and, time. You get your tickets and also. also I just want to, yeah, yeah, tickets sure. are really reasonably priced. I mean, this this is not an expensive thing, and the, the man, Kent Sentner, from, who has produced this event, has just really wanted to, he's done this out of the goodness of his heart and has the absolute purest intention about why he's doing this. It's not a money-making thing. And um, I encourage everyone to just really support his effort and by coming because it, it's not an expensive conference to come to. And I think you'll really benefit from it. Everyone will benefit who comes. So I hope that people will check it out. Now, Leslie, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, should they check your Facebook page? I would recommend the Facebook page. Yeah, it's an open page. You don't have to be a friend. You just go to Facebook and type my name in and go to my author page. And it's a great way to get in touch with me. There's, you can send me a private message or you can just post one, whatever you want. Now, Kane is K-E-A-N, so make sure K -E -A -N. you look up. K-E-A-N, exactly. Right, look up Leslie Kane. Colonel Hall, do you have a website? No, I don't. I don't even have a Facebook. Hey. For very good reason. I right. agree with you, sir. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> I think getting messed up with this can sometimes be a double-edged sword. Google my name and you'll, you'll find a half a million entries. We know if that. you want to get in touch with Charles Hall, you can send me a message on my Facebook page and maybe it'll get to him. Okay, we understand that. And by the way, you can find us on Facebook. There are two areas called the Paracast Fan Club. Someday there will be one if we figure out how to do it, but you can find us. We're on Twitter. We are also known as the Paracast. And I think we're going to try to set up a page on Tumblr, which is a service that Yahoo just bought. Chris is found at OurStrangePlanet.com. That's OurStrangePlanet.com. Leslie Kane, Colonel Charles Halt. 
Thank you both for joining us this week on the Paracast. Just wanted to thank you very much for having us, having me on and for having Charles Holt on and for also giving us an opportunity to talk about the upcoming conference. And it's just always great to be with you guys. I really appreciate the intelligence of your questions and how well you, you know the subject and really know what to ask that brings out the right information. So it's always a pleasure to be with you guys. Charles. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. I would look forward to seeing you and all of your fans and your audience at, uh, in North Carolina. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast. <laughs>